Someday we're all gonna learn to leave fairy tales alone. Hi, my name is Haley Whipjack, and today we're talking about all of Once Upon a Time. This is, of course, a real undertaking, and I could not do it without my beautiful, effervescent patrons who have been getting updates and sneak peeks during this whole process, as well as extra videos every single month, but I'll be thanking them more later for now. Weird TV show. So what's Once Upon a Time? Once Upon a Time is a TV show that aired on ABC for seven seasons from 2011 to 2018. It has a simple enough premise. That being, every fairy tale character is real and was banished from fairy tale land to our modern world by a dark curse. And it is up to our main character to figure out how she is connected to them and how to break their curse for good. It's simple enough at the start, but the show gets real silly. It's really silly. It's really cheesy. There are a lot of characters and a lot of things going on. It's more soap opera to me than it is anything else. And I truly thought it was a CW show, which is apparently a common misconception if that tells you anything about the tone that we're going to be getting into here. CW, of course, being known for its grounded, easy to follow plot lines that make sense through the whole show. I watched some of the first season of Once Upon a Time when it was airing, when I was 12 years old. And then I followed its progression through Tumblr, through like season three. This was a show that Tumblr adored. Uh, Adored for a little while. Most people I know personally who loved this show only watched about half of it because it started to get too bad. So that's a great sign for us. <laughs> I'm very excited to tell them what they missed and also to learn what they missed. I haven't watched the whole show yet uh, as of recording this. So that's the show. That's the premise. What are we doing here? Um, we are here to recap and discuss all of the events of Once Upon a Time. Its characters, its plot lines, the parts of it that are secretly horror movies glossed over by the canon. It's very messy family tree. Yes, we are tracking the family tree. I will not be defeated. I am not a coward. This show is going to take over my life, and we will all be experiencing the effects of that together as friends. Um, I hope you're ready to hear me become ride or die for some fictional characters, because this show has an ensemble cast, and I've never met an ensemble cast that I couldn't find three to four guys I'd commit atrocities for. This is not going to be different. Also, we're here to play dress up. I am so excited to put together some real outfits. I'm currently in the closest thing I have to the main character's iconic red leather jacket. Um, pink pleather is all you're going to get from me right now. I'm so sorry. I do hope that you're thinking to yourself, hang on, how long is the show you said we're going to talk about all of? It's seven, se it's seven seasons. It's seven seasons long, and it's a show that was made and aired pre-streaming model. So we're looking at 22 episodes per season and around 42 minutes per episode. So if you did want to watch all of Once Upon a Time to avoid spoilers from May, you would be looking at approximately 15 hours per season or 107 hours for the whole show. And that is not getting into the spinoff show either. Uh, but it, uh, instead of doing that, you can hang out with me. I don't know how long this video is going to shake out to be. If I do end up splitting it into two parts, you are allowed to call me a coward, but you do have to be nice about it. Truly, there is no time to waste here. We have so much to do. I have so much to watch. My Shrek video was only based off of 44 hours of content. So, <laughs> but with that, let's begin. Fit check, fit check, absolutely check the fit. I said I was excited about outfits, and I meant it. Welcome to season one of Once Upon a Time. This show is told using multiple storylines and timelines and is not necessarily told in order. In season one, every episode has a storyline following our modern world and all of our characters going through their lives and their shenanigans of the week in a linear fashion. But every episode also contains the flashback timeline to the fantasy world, the enchanted forest. So what I'm going to have to do is basically alternate between explaining what we learn 
from the backstory, from the Enchanted Forest, and then go on to update you on what is happening in prime timeline real world. Uh, Because those flashbacks relate to what's happening in the real world. The backstory is important as we get it. You will understand. You will understand. I'm going to be going back and forth a lot, but you will understand. I'll be showing you clips and things to help you out. I'll be putting up pictures of the characters and tracking the many, 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 many names they all use. And we will also be tracking the family tree. This sounds like a lot and it sounds confusing because it is, but I am here for you and we're going to get through this together. We're holding hands, okay? You and me, we're holding hands and we're going to skip around through the field as I info dump on you about it, a TV show. <laughs> So let's begin. The first thing we see in the show is Prince Charming riding through the woods on his horse to save his girl. His girl, this Prince Charming's girl, being Snow White, deep in her mystical slumber. I, hey, I really hope you know the story is Snow White and also all the other fairy tales. It's going to make this a lot easier. Yeah, I will always find you. Prince Charming successfully smooches Snow White awake. You know how it goes and it cuts to their wedding where the evil queen bursts into the room. And she looks so good. The evil queen in her bejeweled cape dress pants suit vows to ruin everybody's happily ever afters. And then we cut to the real world. And this is where we get interesting. We meet this kid. Henry Mills is introduced to us as an unaccompanied minor. He's a 10 year old alone in the back of a cab with a stolen credit card. Instantly iconic. He is traveling alone to Boston and he has with him a old fancy looking book of fairy tales. Is Henry Mills the main character? No, he's not. Emma Swan is introduced to us on her 28th birthday in a hot pink bodycon dress. As the soundtrack goes, baby, I'm howling for you. And she meets a man in what looks like a date. The man we're meant to assume is her date calls her the sexiest friendless orphan he's ever met. That's not how I wanted to learn that information about her. Um, But it's not actually a date. Emma Swan is a bail bondsman here to get bail from this guy. That's her job. Her job is tracking down people who have skipped bail. It's what she's good at. Um, The first episode also immediately they tell us Emma Swan has a superpower. And that superpower is that she can tell if people are lying. And sometimes that's fine. So she's a sexy friendless orphan who goes back to her sexy friendless one bedroom apartment in Boston and has herself a cupcake to celebrate her sexy friendless birthday alone. Puts a candle in the cupcake and blows it out and makes a wish. And her wish is to not be alone on her birthday. That's so sad. So who shows up at her door? but Henry Mills. And he instantly declares that he is the son that she gave up for adoption 10 years ago that has tracked her down and he wants her to come back with him to his hometown. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Henry lives in Storybrooke, Maine. And hey, that's such a good name for the town. That is such a good name for a town where a bunch of fairy tale creatures live. Storybrooke? This show crushes it with the naming. Emma Swan, for her part, agrees instantly to go with him. Either she like really, really hates her life and needs something different or no, she must just really, really hate her life and needs to do something else. I guess or she doesn't believe that Henry can make it home in one piece, even though he got here with his stolen credit card just fine. Oh, kid, you've got problems. Yep, and you're gonna fix them. When Emma and Henry get to Storybrooke, uh, Emma realizes that the big clock at the center of town, the big clock tower, is stuck. Time is frozen. And that that's very literal. Not that Emma knows that at this point. <laughs> Though Henry does very quickly jump into explaining to her that everybody here is a trapped fairy tale creature that can't leave and doesn't remember their past, which... Yeah, I guess I wouldn't have let him travel alone either. (laughs) This episode, and honestly, this season, is sort of just introducing us to a parade of characters. Like, for example, this is Archie. Uh, Archibald Hopper is actually his name. He's the therapist in the town. And Henry wastes no time in telling Emma that actually he's also Jiminy Cricket. 
Already a man with two names. But then Archie addresses his Dalmatian that he has as Pongo, which is the name of the Dalmatian from 101 Dalmatians, meaning also he's Roger from 101 Dalmatians, I guess. Does the show address that? No. Am I addressing it? I must. Emma does bring Henry to his mother, his adoptive mother, even though Henry's insisting that his mother is the evil queen from fairy tales. And like she is, but... (laughs) Regina Mills. What a woman. Ow, 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 ow. Regina is the mayor of Storybrooke. She has a big, beautiful house. She offers Emma apple cider. Ah ha, ah ha, ah ha. Um, and Henry starts yelling at her that he found his real mom. So their relationship is good. Also casually just in Regina's house is the town sheriff, Sheriff Graham. I think his last name is Hubert. I didn't write it down. It's Sheriff Graham. I say he was casually there. He was there because Regina's son was presumed missing. I guess was missing. He was a runaway. So Emma Swan has successfully deposited the 10-year-old back into the loving arms of the mayor of Storybrooke, a woman perfectly capable of taking care of him. She says, great, sorry, kid, I literally haven't seen in 10 years, barely looked at when I gave birth to him. I have to go. So she leaves. Or she tries to. (laughs) But on the road heading out of Storybrooke, there's a large wolf. And she has to swerve to not hit it uh, and crashes her car. Hey, can I talk about Emma's car really quick? (laughs) Emma Swan drives a 1972 Volkswagen Super Beetle. It's a model of a VW Bug, okay? It's bright yellow. It's very cute. It's very vintage. And when I was in high school, my car was a blue and white 1972 Volkswagen Super Beetle. So I, like, can't watch any scenes with that yellow bug in it without just being like, ah, it's it's my car. It's my beautiful little car. Ugh. Anytime there's an interior shot of her driving, I'm just, I'm distracted. I'm not, I'm not there. I'm not in the drama. I'm not in the show. I'm thinking about driving that car. (laughs) I was also informed that they just reused that exact same car for Riverdale. They just painted it black and used it for Riverdale. So now I guess I have to watch Riverdale. We'll see how this show goes first. Anyway, Emma comes to locked up in the sheriff's office behind bars. She's in the drunk tank. Basically, they assumed that she was drunk driving, and that's why she crashed her car on a perfectly empty road. There's not wolves in Maine. Every time I get up to put something on the whiteboard, he steals my chair. But he doesn't want to hang out with me because I'm covered in feathers. While Emma is locked up in the drunk tank, we also meet Marco and Leroy. Leroy is also in the drunk tank. He is in the cell right next to Emma's, uh, whistling Whistle While You Work, the little tune from Snow White. And Marco is a man who works there, who scolds Leroy and tells him to be kind and normal. Leroy's a big grouch, and Marco's a real nice man who sadly mentions that he has no children. We tried for many years, but uh, he was no man to be. Well, cry me a river. They do not keep Emma locked up. She is no longer, and in fact was never, intoxicated, and she is set loose to the streets of Storybrooke. Emma is looking for Henry, but she finds Mary Margaret Blanchard. Mary Margaret is Henry's teacher, and she's actually the one who gave Henry the big book of fairy tales that sent him on this mental spiral where he believes everyone in town is secretly a trapped fantasy creature. She gave Henry that book because apparently he's an intensely lonely child, and he needed something to just, like cheer him up. Uh, And Mary Margaret suggests that Emma check Henry's castle if she's still looking for him. Mary Margaret also looks an awful lot like the Snow White that we saw in the opening of the episode. Emma does find Henry at his castle. It's a big old wooden playground that's sort of shaped like a castle. It is his like clubhouse hideaway. Emma tries to assure Henry that the reason that she didn't keep him. The reason that she's not in his life is because she wanted Henry to have his best chance. And at the time, she was not his best chance. She also relates to him by 
letting him know that she was abandoned on the side of a freeway as an infant. So she never knew her parents either. I don't know if that would make me feel better. (laughs) Emma doesn't talk to kids much, I don't think. (laughs) So Emma gets Henry back to his mom, and Regina makes it clear that Emma is not welcome into Henry's life, that she does not want Emma to stick around. She doesn't want Emma talking to her son. Emma at no point implied to Regina that she wanted to stick around in Storybrooke or in Henry's life in any capacity, but Regina explicitly threatens to destroy her. Hello? You may have given birth to him, but he is my son. I was- No, you don't get to speak. You don't get to do anything. Regina does make it clear to Emma that she really does love Henry uh, and then immediately finds Henry's book of fairy tales and steals it, just takes it. Emma comes away from her conversation with Regina not loving the vibes and decides to maybe stay for just a little while just to see how it goes. So she goes to Granny's Bed and Breakfast and asks for a room. Granny's Bed and Breakfast is run by Granny and is also helped out by Granny's granddaughter, Ruby, who we see exclusively in the tiniest skirt imaginable, always seeming to be bending over a table, clearing away the dishes. It's a very intentional choice. The last person that this episode introduces us to is Mr. Gold. Mr. Gold owns a pawn shop slash antique store and is also like everybody's landlord. He meets Emma, learns her name, says her name a bunch of times, and then walks off. Across town, Mary Margaret Blanchard is volunteering at the hospital because she's the perfect human being. The show wants us to know she can do literally nothing wrong. She's a perfect, innocent, beautiful little baby, and she is caring for a coma patient. A coma patient who perfectly matches the face and description of Prince Charming. And Henry, locked in his beautiful mansion, staring out the window, watches as the clock at the center of town begins to move. And I literally haven't even explained the fairy tale timeline of the first episode yet. It's the first episode of the first season, so there's a lot to set up and a lot to do, but I'm so sorry. That's the real world. That's where we are now. And the backstory that we get to start with does a lot of the same heavy lifting in terms of setting up who the players are and exactly what happened. I already told you part of it. Snow White and Prince Charming get married. The evil queen is mad about it and vows that nobody will get a happily ever after. So then what do you do? Well, if you are a pregnant Snow White, you fear for your unborn child's safety because an evil witch queen just insisted that you'll never be happy. I think it's a valid fear. So you, pregnant Snow White, decide you need to go to somebody who will be able to tell you straight up if your child is safe. Who do you go to? You go to a man locked up in your jail cells who can see the future And his name is Rumpelstiltskin. Rumpelstiltskin is Mr. Gold. But (laughs) Rumpelstiltskin does not look or act like Mr. Gold. Robert Carlyle is a character actor. Every time Rumpelstiltskin is on screen, he's giggling, he's frolicking, he's doing this with his arms. Constantly, it's this motion with a little little giggle. (laughs) Magic always comes with a price. I love him so much. Weird, scaly, sorcerer, trickster, lizard boy. He means the world to me. Rebel Stiltskin is willing to give Snow White the information that he has, but the price is information of her daughter's name. Dangerous when you're working with a Rumple Stiltskin, surely. Snow agrees she has no choice, and Rumple Stiltskin tells her that the evil queen has a dark curse. It's called the dark curse. And the dark curse will transport everyone in the enchanted forest to a world without magic. But (laughs) though they will be trapped in a land where they must all suffer frozen in time for eternity and there are no happy endings, Snow White's child on her 28th birthday (laughs) will become the savior, and save them all from their curse, bringing happy endings back to the world. (laughs) 28 is such... (laughs) I think... (laughs) I think what happened is the the show writers went, okay, 
So Henry's going to be 10 because that's the age that we want Henry to be, which means that Emma, well, we don't want to be weird. So we'll say Emma gave birth when she was 18 because we don't want to get like too deep into it being a teen pregnancy situation. So she'll give birth when she was 18, which means when he's 10, she'll be 28. So no problem. The prophecy will be about when she's 28 years old. That's so random. I'm obsessed with it. Snow White thanks Rumpelstiltskin for the information and lets him know that her daughter's name will be, d- drum roll, Emma. Not a very fantasy name, but that's okay. Your name is Snow White. You're naming your daughter Emma? Snow White holds like a war room to make a plan, and the blue fairy lets her know that there is an enchanted tree that could be made into something that will transport one person to the world that they're going to safely. Memories intact, not part of the curse, one person. Snow White really doesn't want to be the person that goes through and isn't affected by the curse because she doesn't want to leave Prince Charming behind. But hey, uh, babe, it's y- you're the one carrying the kid that's going to break it. So super sorry. Say bye to your husband. Uh, and then she starts going into labor. As she goes into labor, smoke starts rolling into the enchanted forest. The curse has arrived. Uh, oh, God. Also, in that war room, we found out that Leroy is uh, grumpy. The dwarf, the dwarves in the show are just played by men that are kind of short. Uh, like the actor that plays Leroy is five foot four, which is a, per- a perfectly regular height. It's just kind of short. All the dwarves are just men that are kind of short. <laughs> and Marco, nice man who weirdly made a sad pointed comment that he doesn't have children. It's actually Geppetto, famously a father of Pinocchio. We'll get back to that later, though. Snow White gives birth. And now the only option is to put the newborn into this magical wardrobe alone. So that's what she does. She puts her newborn into the magical wardrobe alone and the baby vanishes. While Snow is doing that, Charming is seemingly killed in a sword fight against the evil queen's knights. He is just left bleeding out on the floor. That's where Snow White finds him, and that's where the evil queen finds them, gleefully recounting the fact that they are all going to go to a land with no happy endings. They're going somewhere absolutely horrible. And, like, I've never been to Maine, but that does feel rude. And then they are all transported by the dark curse. I Not every episode recap is going to be this long, I swear to God. So let's see what we're looking at for that family tree, huh? I don't know what everyone was going on about. It's not that complicated, all right? Prince Charming and Snow White had a baby. That baby is Emma Swan. Emma Swan, an unnamed man, had a baby. That baby is Henry Mills, and Henry Mills was adopted by Regina Mills, who is Snow White's stepmother. I didn't actually know how to notate that, but we'll keep our eye on that as we go, huh? Before the evil queen could cast the dark curse, she needed specific components. And she's telling her evil plan to her magic mirror, played by Giancarlo Esposito. Post Breaking Bad, Giancarlo Esposito. Okay. She's also telling her whole plan to an elderly man around that is her valet. Uh, But basically, she needs to go to... Maleficent, you know, the evil queen dragon lady from Sleeping Beauty. They're old friends. She needs to go to Maleficent for the dark curse so she can cast it. Regina traps Maleficent, tries to kill her pet horse, calls Maleficent her only friend, and then walks off to enact the dark curse she just stole back. She's so iconic. (laughs) But her first try to cast the curse doesn't work. So she storms off to Rumpelstiltskin, the man that gave her the curse in the first place, apparently. And he tells her the thing that she's missing is the heart of what she loves the most. And she's like, um, I killed my favorite horse for this. And he's like, you dumb bitch. You think a horse is going to (laughs) work? It's gotta be something you love, idiot. Also, for this last minute advice, he insists on a favor, which is that in the real world, Regina will have to do anything he asks as long as he says please. Even though he won't remember, (laughs) he won't remember that that's part of the deal. He just wants it in there. Love him. You must heed my every request. You must do whatever I say. 
so long as I say. Please. He knows he's never going to remember to use his goddamn manners. So Regina goes to kill the thing she does truly love, which is her elderly valet, who is actually her father. She murders her father, the only person <laughs> who loves her, and I guess the only person she still loves. And she takes his heart, and she squishes it, and casts her curse with it. Her father, like, pleads with her to just give this up and go, and they could go anywhere else and be happy. And then she stabs him. She does apologize, though. She does something. Also, her dad's name was Henry. So that that's why Henry is named Henry, because Regina's dad was named Henry Mills. So now his name is Henry Mills. I don't think her dad's last name was actually Mills. <laughs> In the real world, the magic mirror is a man named Sidney Glass. Sidney Glass. And he is a reporter. He's an investigative reporter in Regina's pocket. And he has been spending his time finding any dirt he can about Emma Swan. There's like none, though. Emma's record is pretty clean, which Regina's pissed about. Henry buys Emma a uh, hot cocoa at Granny's because presumably he still has that stolen credit card. It's Mary Margaret's, by the way. He stole his teacher's credit card. <laughs> nobody like did anything about that uh, he buys her a hot chocolate and says it is up to the two of them to break this curse operation cobra he calls it is now in effect emma doesn't believe a single word this child is saying but she does want to know what's going on here emma finds out that regina has been the mayor as long as anyone can remember that's a spooky sentiment in that and he goes to check with archie town therapist about Henry and Archie gives her Henry's entire file. Jiminy Cricket, you are going to lose your therapy license that y you were given by way of a curse. I, guess. I don't think he went to college. Archie does immediately snitch to Regina, though it was apparently Regina's idea to give Emma Henry's whole file because that's illegal and Emma accepting that is bad. So then the sheriff shows up at Emma's door to arrest her and get that file back while like sensually grabbing her wrists, the energy. Sheriff Graham is also played by a pre-Fifty Shades of Grey, Jamie Dornan, Chris Christian Grey of the, of the Fifty Shades. Not that I'm saying that that matters for this scene where he is sensually <laughs> handcuffing Emma Swan <laughs> to arrest her, but I did want you to know. Regina tells Henry that Emma has been arrested and Henry's response is to remind his adoptive mother that he hates her so bad. <laughs> he's, like, he's like, you're not sorry and you're not my mom. Uh, and instead, he's just really excited that Emma was out there getting intel for Operation Cobra. Mary Margaret bails Emma <laughs> out of jail and Emma immediately responds by going to the mayor's house with a chainsaw and destroying part of Regina's prized apple tree, which I guess if you wanted to immediately go back to jail, she doesn't, for some reason, face any consequences for that. But Granny says that she can't stay there anymore because they are not allowed to house felons. A new rule. <laughs> Emma's beautiful, perfect car gets booted and Regina invites her to talk. In Emma and Regina's conversation, Regina manipulates it so that Emma discredits Henry's theory and basically calls him crazy while Henry is in earshot to, like, break his heart, make him not want her around anymore. It works. Henry's devastated, but only for a little bit, because pretty shortly after, Emma assures Henry in a separate location that she just needed to make the evil queen believe that she didn't think the curse was real so that they could continue their operation. Don't worry, Henry. I totally believe that your teacher is Snow White. Yes. Regina, for her part, burns the pages of Henry's book that explain how to stop the dark curse and then goes to yell at Mr. Gold for Emma sticking around. It is not his fault. <laughs> it turns out Mr. Gold is the one who got Henry for Regina in the first place, like sourced this baby for her from across the country. And she's like, you wanted Emma to come here. Why did you want that? That's so weird. Uh, and he asks her to drop the issue, please. Making it clear that he has regained his memories 
of being Rumpelstiltskin. Now, he regained those memories when he first heard Emma's name. That is why he needed that information from Snow White when she wanted to know about the curse. So he heard Emma's name. It unlocked all of his fairy tale memories. And now he's just a little trickster living in town. <laughs> Let's talk some more Enchanted Forest, Snow White, Prince Charming backstory, shall we? Prince Charming had a fiance before Snow White came into the picture. Her name was Abigail and she was King Midas's daughter. Uh, their marriage was to combine the two kingdoms so that Prince Charming's father, King George, could have access to all the riches of King Midas, you know. Fairy tale marriage stuff. But one day the two of them are on a tense and uncomfortable cart ride. They don't like each other much. They are stopped by a thief who's here to ambush them, and that thief is Snow White. Snow White steals all of the jewels that they have and immediately sells them before Prince Charming managed to catch up with her, demanding his wedding ring back, his mother's wedding ring back, please. Uh, but it is gone. She has sold it, and also she does not believe that true love exists. So the two of them go on a little adventure to get the ring back. He saves her life. She saves his life. She says that the evil queen hates her and has wanted posters out for her because she ruined Regina's life. And when Charming's like, did, did you do that? You really, like, she blames you for it and you really did it? She's like, yeah, I ruined her life. I did. And now she never wants me to be happy again. That's how it goes. <laughs> they do get Prince Charming's mother's wedding ring back. He tells Snow White that his name is actually James. Charming is just like a nickname that Snow gave him actually at this meeting. I don't, people were just calling him James before that. And the two of them go their separate ways so that Charming is free to marry this lady. In the real world, Mary Margaret has really bad luck with the whole dating thing. In fact, she goes on a first date with Dr. Whale and he spends the entire time staring at Ruby's ass in her tiny skirt bent over those tables. It's it's all she does. It's all she does. It made me so mad. <laughs> Not at Ruby. Lord, she could never do anything wrong. I love her dearly, but like... Let her stand up. Mary Margaret and Emma are also roommates now. Mary just invites Emma to stay with her because grannies won't take her because of the crimes. And Mary takes her class of, I think, fifth graders to the hospital for a field trip. I guess it's like a volunteering trip for the children to volunteer. And Henry is just fascinated by this coma patient who's a John Doe. Nobody knows who he is. But Henry does notice that this John Doe has the same scar that Prince Charming does in the pictures of his storybook. His storybook pictures do look exactly like the people in town. I don't know how that one is explained in terms of people not believing him or thinking it's weird. But they do look exactly like the people in town. Henry convinces Mary Margaret to read fairy tales to this John Doe, and she reads to him the story of Snow White and Prince Charming meeting. And when she does so, his hand twitches. He has been comatose, as far as these people are aware, for seven years. Regina found him on the side of the road, brought him to the hospital seven years ago. No brain function. Snow White reads him this story about Snow White, and all of a sudden, here he is. Dr. Whale immediately snitches about it to Regina. <laughs> and then the next day, John Doe is gone. He just walked himself out of the hospital. If you are comatose for seven years, you are not just getting up and walking. Your legs <laughs> will not function like that. Whatever. Henry, Emma, Mary Margaret, and Sheriff Graham find our John Doe collapsed... <laughs> unconscious in the river. Mary Margaret uh, really poorly does some CPR. And then arriving onto the scene is Catherine Nolan, here for her husband, David Nolan. I don't know why I said that like it was a reveal. I hadn't told you his name was David yet. His name's David. Catherine Nolan was really in town the whole time. The whole time. Seven years, supposedly. Never checked to see what happened to her husband when he vanished. Uh, I guess never saw the newspapers about how the mayor found a man on the side of the road. Um, was so supremely unworried, it seems. And Emma's like, yeah, that's normal. That's not weird. That, there, there's definitely no weird magic things happening there. Sounds about right. 
Okay. Mary Margaret and Emma do also know at this point, by the way, that Henry Mills believes that Mary Margaret Blanchard is Snow White and that Emma Swan is Snow White's daughter. So they do know (laughs) that this 10-year-old thinks that she's her mom, which they do think is funny. And also their roommate dynamic is so cute. They're really cute as like best friends. Come on. There's that wall. That's not a wall. Let's go back to fairy tale land. Cinderella! Cinderella. In the enchanted forest, pre dark curse, pre anything else, uh, desperately wishing to go to the ball to meet her prince, not Prince Charming, her prince uh, is approached by a fairy godmother who wants to help. And then her fairy godmother that approached her is immediately <laughs> exploded <laughs> by Rumple Stiltskin. Her new fairy godmother. Yup, this weird man is Cinderella's fairy godmother. He takes the exploded fairy's magic wand. He agrees to help get Cinderella to that ball for a for a price, and the price is her firstborn child. Surprise! Um, she agrees, and he magics her into a genuinely beautiful Cinderella dress. This is such a good Cinderella dress. I'm obsessed with it. Cinderella, of course, does go to the ball. She falls in love with her prince, Prince Thomas. They get married and she gets pregnant. But she does not want to give evil scaly wizard lizard man her firstborn child. She wants to go back on the deal. So Prince Thomas, Prince Charming, and Cinderella trick Rumpelstiltskin into signing an altered version of the contract that strips his magic it like it like nullifies him he does it he signs the contract and it nullifies his powers it like freezes him in place but as soon as he signs it prince thomas vanishes disappears into the void all magic comes with a price and rumpelstiltskin tells cinderella that she will never see him again prince thomas again until her baby is his Why do you want it, though? In the real world, Cinderella is Ashley Boyd, a heavily pregnant 19-year-old housemaid who's just doing her best. Ashley Boyd, desperate, down on her luck, no self-esteem to her name, breaks into Mr. Gold's pawn shop. He finds her doing so, and (laughs) she pepper sprays him. And Mr. Gold goes to Emma about the break-in. He doesn't want Ashley arrested. He doesn't want her life ruined. He just wants his stuff back. (laughs) Ashley's process of leaving town involves having a conversation with Henry in which he's so excited to learn that she has a stepmom and stepsisters because that means she's Cinderella. But mostly what she does is talk to Ruby because they are good friends, and she borrows or takes... Ruby agrees to give Ashley her car. Ashley's plan is just to get to Boston, just to just go, just go. But what happens when she tries to leave town? She crashes her car and ends up in labor (laughs) on the side of the road. Emma, in the process of searching for Ashley, finds the father of Ashley's child, Sean, here. He's Thomas in Fairytaleland. Here he is, Sean. Sean still lives with his dad, and his dad is who convinced Sean to break up with Ashley and also who convinced them to sell Ashley's baby to Mr. Gold. I do have questions there. That's not something you can do, right? You can, right? I just feel like sell me your baby is exclusively a fairy tale dealing. You don't do that in Maine, dude. So Mr. Gold hears that Ashley has gone into labor and goes to the hospital to collect his baby, his merchandise he has purchased, his baby. And Emma stops him and is like, you, man, you can't do that. <laughs> I'm not going to let you take that 19-year-old's kid, please. And he agrees that he will not forcefully take Ashley Boyd's newborn daughter But (laughs) Emma has to do just an unspecified favor for him in the future. And she's like, yeah, fine, whatever. Leave the girl alone. Ashley names her baby Alexandra. Sean shows up to the hospital and meets his daughter. They basically agree to give it another try. And who cares what his dad thinks? So they're good. They're parents. They're cute. Ashley and Sean are very cute. Sheriff Graham offers the position of deputy to Emma Swan, which she accepts. So she's a 
cop now. And also has a job in Storybrooke. So she's not going anywhere, which you think would piss off Regina. And I think it does. But she can't be that mad because Regina and Graham are... They're having an affair. <laughs> Surely it's not an affair. None of them are married. They, ha they have a physical relationship. Hey, let me tell you about Jiminy Cricket's backstory. <laughs> Jiminy Cricket was born a, a human boy. <laughs> A regular human child with human parents who were scam artists and tricksters and used their very cute small human son to aid in their schemes and then continued to use their son even as he became a full grown like adult in his 40s. And he just kept doing whatever they said, I, I guess, because it's all he's ever known. Stand up, please. One day, adult Jiminy is offered an umbrella by a small child to shield him from the rain. And this genuine act of kindness kind of surprises him because Jiminy's a very nice boy, but he is not surrounded by nice people. <laughs> Jiminy Cricket is already in cahoots with Rumpelstiltskin. He, like, drops off some stolen goods that were promised to the lizard wizard trickster boy, and Rumpelstiltskin gives him a potion that will free him from his parents. That That's like all he says. And Jiminy is nervous, but he takes it. Jiminy's parents realize that their meek coward son has a fancy little potion, and they use it on a nice couple that lets them in and stay with them for the night because they're just kind of wanderers. They don't really have a place to live. Perfectly nice couple. Let's them in. They're already scamming these people with an entirely different scheme they've got going, and they just give them the random potion that Jiminy had. And that nice couple turns into puppets, which is really freaky and bad because they turn into puppets that we have seen in Mr. Gold's antique shop. In episodes we've already had, and it turns out that that very nice couple was also parents to the little boy that gave Jiminy that umbrella and shielded him from the rain. And that little boy was Geppetto. <laughs> it's the cliche of this show that you will see any nondescript person and it'll be like, and they were this person all along. But that, that's how I felt just now. It was Geppetto the whole time. Jiminy Cricket feels awful and he begs the blue fairy to give him a second chance on life and a way to do some good. So she turns him into a cricket. I don't, I don't think that's, I, I would have been a little upset, I guess. Like I wanted a do over. I didn't want to be a bug, ma'am. But Jiminy's not mad. He's a very good and pleasant boy. And the blue fairy says he will live as many years as he needs to. Uh, to help Geppetto, to stay with Geppetto. So he, he goes off to help Geppetto as a bug. Uh, Jiminy Cricket as a concept has never made sense to me. In the real world, Archie and Marco, Jiminy and Geppetto, are besties. I do love it. Emma Swan officially becomes the Storybrooke deputy, and the second she clips on the badge, a sinkhole opens beneath town. And as that's happening, Regina demands that Archie cure Henry of these delusions. Just... Tell my son he's crazy so he stops calling me evil, please. And he does. He does do that. He does look at the 10-year-old and say he needs to stop having these delusions. 30 seconds into the therapy appointment to which Henry runs. He just, he runs away. He leaves. And where does Henry run? Directly into the sinkhole that opened because Emma decided to stay in Storybrooke. He investigates a sinkhole. He's 10. Archie goes in to find him because he believes it's his fault. It's not, but he does believe that. And as Archie goes in to get him, the mine is collapsed with explosives because the other people in the town are trying to fix the sinkhole situation. So Archie is left just hanging out with Henry underground. Henry apologizes for getting the two of them trapped in the mine. I would say it is more his fault. Then it is Archie. Above ground, Emma and Regina are just yelling at each other, <laughs> freaking out because Henry's life is in danger. There's there's a moment, there's a moment in this where Emma insists that she needs to go down there to get Henry because Henry is her son, and Regina moves into her space in a way that is so charged, I really, really fully thought they were gonna make out. <laughs> mm. <laughs> I, that was that was the whole energy, is that Regina was getting into her space and was gonna angrily plant one. Honor. She didn't. 
It's like a whole thing that those two never kiss in this show. I can do this. Just bring him to me. Anyway, they save Henry. He's fine. <laughs> Mary Margaret quits her volunteer hospital position with a very fancy resignation letter. It's a volunteer position. And as she does so, the camera shows us that in that sinkhole, in that mine, is Snow White's glass coffin from when she was poison appled. Bum, bum, bum! What does that matter? <laughs> I'll give you a hint. It doesn't. But it is a cool visual. Catherine Nolan throws David Nolan, her husband, a sort of welcome home from being comatose party. And he leaves his own party early to go find Mary Margaret. He has immediately decided he is choosing Mary Margaret over his wife. He does not know Mary Margaret. He also does not know his wife. But he immediately chooses that he would like to be with this one. Fully just wants to leave his wife. He has a lot of amnesia and no cares in the world. He goes to Mary Margaret's job. She's a school teacher. He goes there like while there's children present to find and talk to her. And he tells her to meet him at the bridge on the outskirts of town if she wants to talk and if she wants to choose them. Who is them? Come on. And that night, David gets lost on his way to the bridge because of all the amnesia, even though he suggested meeting there. And he finds himself in Mr. Gold's shop, which I don't... Did you think the bridge was going to be in the shop, my man? It's not. So Gold gives him directions to the bridge. But while being in this shop, which is by this point we have realized full of things from the Enchanted Forest that these people don't remember, um, David sees a windmill. That windmill used to be in his house in Storybrook, and it breaks his amnesia, by which I mean it fills his head with his curse memories. So now he remembers being married to Catherine, he remembers working at the animal rescue, but it does not fix the curse memory issue where he doesn't remember being a prince. Does that make sense? So then he does go to the bridge where Mary Margaret is because she does want to choose them. And he goes there to let her down and say that he actually can't choose her because he has a wife. <laughs> You've had a wife the whole time. And now Dr. Whale is trying to move in on Mary Margaret again for some reason. And I want to be mad at David, but we do also learn his fairy tale backstory and it is fucked up. Prince James Charles. Charles? Prince James Charming accepts a quest to slay a dragon. Okay? He accepts the quest from King Midas, father of Princess Abigail. He goes on the quest and dies. He gets impaled, fully dead, can't be resurrected, no more. Prince James. Rumpelstiltskin appears. I, I said the show was out of order, and I need you to know it's so out of order, okay? This is backstory from, I think, before anything else I've told you <laughs> about the Enchanted Forest. Because when I first told you about Rumpelstiltskin, he was in jail. And then I told you about when he got trapped so that he could be put in jail. And we're pre-jail again. Pre-jail again. Rumpelstiltskin is here. Assume he's everywhere. Rumpelstiltskin shows up to scold King George. Oh, I need to get King George. To scold King George for letting one of his gifts go to waste. Rumpelstiltskin tells King George that if King George will tell him where the fairy godmothers are, he'll tell King George where to find another son. So that's their deal. And it turns out that Prince James had a twin brother who's a farm boy who lives with just his mother. So we're not even halfway through this first season, and they're pulling weird twin shit. That's how soap opera-y we are. Basically, King George didn't have any children, and instead there was a set of twins born to a couple on a farm, and Rumpelstiltskin took one of those twins and gave him to the king, and said, this is your kid now. Do whatever you please. And he raised a real asshole named James. But David still lives on that farm. And David is told that if he does not pretend to be James and complete the dragon slaying quest, his mother will be killed. So 
So he goes on a dragon slaying quest. Actually, he's brought along on the quest under the uh, assumption that he will not be killing a dragon because he has no experience killing anything and that the knights will kill the dragon. But he just needs to be there so that they can tell Midas that he was there and he can fully take James's place. But <clears throat> David's just that good. And he does kill the dragon. They give the dragon's head to Midas and Midas says, oh, thank you so much. And now to repay you, all that, all that gold I promised you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Also, marry my daughter. You have to marry my daughter. And David tries to be like, ah, oh, that's so sweet. No, th no, thank you. That's so sweet. No, thank you. Um, but King George says, if you don't do it, your mom is your mom. So he says, oh, my God, thank you. I'd love to marry your daughter. Yay. <laughs> she seems great. They do let him say goodbye forever to his mom, which is nice of them. And that's where his mother gives him uh, the wedding ring that caused so much issue between him and Snow White. Hey, it's so fucked up that he just had to live as a different guy for years. He just had to be fully transplanted into someone else's life, go by a different name, and just have everybody treat him like a different guy. That's... I hate, thinking about that makes me so uncomfortable. They don't even say that his name is David in this episode. It's like next season, he comments that his name has always been David. But this season, they just let you sit in kind of the discomfort of we don't even know for sure what his name was. We just know that it doesn't matter because everybody cared that he was James, even though he wasn't James. Like he isn't James, but for Every reason that matters, yes, he is. That is, that's like an existential horror to me. We need to talk about Sheriff Graham because his life does not go well. Sheriff Graham in the fantasy land was the huntsman. Basically, he was just a guy who felt a really close kinship with wolves and lived in the woods. And the evil queen went, you're perfect. Kill my stepdaughter for me, would ya? I need her heart. I need you to kill her and I need you to bring me her heart. Thank you. And he went, okay. But he couldn't do it because when he got Snow White alone and she realized he was going to kill her, she wrote a letter to Regina basically saying like, I'm so sorry, you'll never be happy. I forgive you for all the evil that you've done. And he was like, oh, well, I can't kill you. So he doesn't. And he brings a different heart back to the evil queen who realizes what he's done takes his heart out of his chest. That's a thing you can do in Once Upon a Time. You can reach into someone's chest, pull out their beating heart, and just have it. And this is all, this is, this story is how we find out what that does to you. If you, you, were to reach into someone's chest and pull out their heart and have it, while you are holding it, you can control their every action. They lose all autonomy and it's yours. Uh, and then if you squish it and crumble it into dust, they die. So that's sort of the, the function of a heart. So the evil queen takes his heart, says that she's keeping him forever, and asks her guards to bring him to her bedroom. And like, that's where we leave it? Oh my God, Regina. I know there's not a lot of people in your life who want to spend time with you, but you can't do that? In the real world, as all this is going on, Emma's his deputy, Sheriff Graham starts to have visions of the enchanted forest. He feels empty. He feels numb. He is desperate for any sort of emotion. He kisses Emma in the middle of the street. Emma rejects him, says she doesn't want anything to do that, so he goes and makes out with Regina instead. He's losing it. He's trying to tell Mary Margaret that they know each other. Mr. Gold is validating that these are visions from another life. That's not making him feel better. So Graham and Regina go to a tomb that has a symbol on the outside that Graham is recognizing from his visions. Graham is insisting that this is where the evil queen has hidden his heart, to which Emma says, oh my God, not you too, please. And then who shows up but Regina? Because this is her father's tomb and she's very upset that they're there. Regina accuses Emma of stealing Graham from her and they get into a physical altercation about it. So later Graham is like tenderly caring for Emma's wounds that she got fighting for his honor. Uh, and while they're doing that, Regina storms beneath the vault, pulls a magic glowing beating heart out of a little drawer and crumbles it into dust. And Sheriff Graham falls over dead. 
in the arms of an angel. I don't even know how I want to notate that he's dead. Just, I'll figure it out later. He's dead, okay? I didn't like him very much anyway. R.I.P. Jamie Dornan. Jamie Dornan's fine. R.I.P. Sheriff Graham. You will be immediately forgotten. Two weeks later, Emma has been acting as the sheriff because the other sheriff mysteriously and spontaneously passed away. However, sheriff is technically an elected official position, and Regina decides to appoint Sidney Gla Sydney Glass, her magic mirror. But Emma goes to find Mr. Gold for some advice. In here? What well, is my job? And Mr. Gold tells her that she can just run against Sydney, and if the town votes for her, she gets to stay sheriff. Sydney publishes a story in the paper about how Emma gave birth to Henry while she was in jail, which is true, but oh my god. He does it because Regina wants Emma smeared in the public eye so they don't vote for her for sheriff, and also so that Henry stops wanting to be around her all the time. It doesn't work. He wants to be around her all the time. Emma goes to visit Regina at one point, and while she is there, the building they are in spontaneously bursts into flames, and Emma saves Regina from the fire, even though Regina thinks Emma might leave her there for dead. She does not. The fire was started by gold and gold tells emma well i did that so you could do a big heroic thing and the whole town would respect you and it worked everyone thinks you are such a hero and they want to vote for you for sheriff and then there's a big debate with emma and sydney for the whole town to come to and everybody is so on team emma because of all the heroics she did but emma feels awful about it because it was a set up planned <laughs> building fire so emma tells the whole town Actually, that fire was started by Mr. Gold. I didn't know that was the plan, but that was his plan all along. I am so sorry that he has led both of us astray, both me and you. I did not intend for this, and I don't trust him. I don't trust him, and I don't want to work with him. And then it turns out that was Gold's plan all along, because everyone in town is afraid of Mr. Gold. And so to manipulate a situation where Emma stands up to him and <laughs> tells him off publicly, everybody is so impressed that they vote for her for sheriff. It works. Emma's sheriff. Emma is chief cop. Yay. He does this because he wants Emma to be sheriff so that she's in a better position to someday pay back that favor that she owes him because <laughs> she wouldn't let him purchase a baby? Let's talk about how Rumpelstiltskin became Rumpelstiltskin, because he was not... Well, he, w he was born Rumpelstiltskin. His name was always Rumpelstiltskin, <laughs> but he used to be a regular human man, and in fact was a coward, and that's it. His one personality trait was coward. He's so hard to watch. Not because Robert Carlyle is doing a bad job. Robert Carlyle is doing an incredible job portraying a man that is very difficult to watch navigate the world because he's so much of a coward. Rumpelstiltskin, pre-magic powers, has a son. He has a 13-year-old son. His wife left him a long time ago because Rumpelstiltskin wouldn't fight in the Ogre Wars, and she left him for being a coward. There's Ogre Wars. His son is Balefire. He calls him Bay. It's actually, it's actually, it's actually very cute. And Balefire is 13 years old, about to turn 14. And when children turn 14, they are sent to fight in the Ogre Wars, which he obviously does not want for his boy. So Rumpelstiltskin goes running off into the woods in search of help. <laughs> as everyone in this show does. If you just surround yourself with trees in a desperate enough situation, someone will appear to tell you what to do. An old man in the woods tells Rumpelstiltskin that in the Duke's castle, there is a very powerful dagger. On that dagger is the true name of the Dark One. And if Rumpelstiltskin takes that dagger, he can take that power for himself and his son will never have to be in danger again. So Rumpelstiltskin takes his 13-year-old son to partially burn down a castle. <laughs> his one character trait is coward. They make it so clear. And then all of a sudden, he's committing arson. <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> they burn down a good chunk of the castle. They find the dagger, and the name on the dagger says Zoso, the true name of the Dark One. Rumpelstiltskin 
puts his boy back home, takes the dagger into the woods, and summons the Dark One, Zoso, who it turns out is the old man that told him how to get that dagger in the first place. Zoso is the one who sent him on this mission. And Zoso kind of manipulates Rumpelstiltskin into stabbing him and killing him with the dagger. And then he laughs and says, like, finally, he wanted to die so bad. Because the only way you can kill the Dark One is to stab them with the Dark One dagger. And apparently, Zoso was so sick of being the Dark One that he needed to find anybody, anybody that he could trick into doing this. It's a good sign. It's a really good sign because the thing about that is if you are the one who ends the current Dark One, you become the new Dark One. So Rumpelstiltskin finds that his skin is beginning to change and go all scaly and gold, and that the name on the dagger has changed to, say, Rumpelstiltskin. His 13-year-old son is not a fan (laughs) of the changes to his father, of the new vibe that his father is bringing into the space. He very quickly becomes a weird, sadistic, giggly little man. He gets power for the first time in his life, defaults to murder (laughs) defaults to ruining people's lives he's not a good dude and the child doesn't like it very much this is important this will be very important later there is an entire episode for hansel and gretel's backstory and it doesn't matter literally at all okay here's what matters about that episode hansel and gretel were separated from their father and kidnapped by the evil queen and sent to The Blind Witch's House. The Blind Witch's House looks like concept art. It's the funniest shot. (laughs) That's important. How funny The Blind Witch's House looks is important. Hansel and Gretel immediately break the rules. However, they do still get out of the house and successfully steal what the evil queen wanted from them, which it turns out is the poison apple. Okay? That's all that matters in the Fantasyland bit is Hansel, Hansel and Gretel? Hansel and Gretel? Got Regina the poison apple she needed to get rid of Snow White. And in the real world, Emma Swan finds Ava and Nicholas, two homeless children, and immediately makes it her mission to find them their father. She does. And then is so pushy to get this man who did not know that he had twins to suddenly take in 10-year-old twins. She's so pushy about it. And it's because she's projecting. It is because she is projecting and she thinks that it's awful that this person who has the chance to take their kids back with no issue doesn't want it, wants them gone. She convinces him in the end and he takes his kids, but it is, it's weird vibes the whole time. Henry has also started asking questions about his dad, and it's weird that it took him this long to start asking questions about his dad. Emma tells him that his father was a hero and died saving people from a burning building because he was a firefighter. She's a big liar. She is just saying anything. So that episode has very little in it uh, plot-wise that I care about, but I do need to have a little uh, sidebar with you, a little tangent with you about some of the mechanisms of how Storybrooke works and the fact that there are kids here. Because, oh my god, there are kids here. The townspeople were frozen for 28 years, haven't changed for 28 years. Henry got here 10 years ago, and nobody changed for 18 years before that or for the 10 years since he's arrived. Mr. Gold specifically procured the Savior's Child, even though I'm pretty sure he didn't know he was doing that because he did not have his memories at the time. And Henry grew up normally. He did not stay a newborn. He arrived a newborn and has since become a 10-year-old child. Everybody else has not. And the thing about children is they don't really know what different stages of adulthood look like. If he saw Mary Margaret staying the same for 10 years, it wouldn't process. If he saw his mom staying the same for 10 years, it wouldn't process. But there are other kids here. So I guess everyone else just acknowledges that Ava and Nicholas are going into sixth grade and Henry just has to sit there and go, they're going to sixth grade again? What do you mean they're going to sixth grade again? And everyone else just the thought melts away from their brain because of the curse. And they're just like, yeah, why would that be weird? They're going into sixth grade again, obviously. 
Henry just had to be pointing out little things that he noticed that would eventually become much bigger things. Like, hey, has anybody noticed that Ashley Boyd has been heavily pregnant for 28 years? Or as far as Henry knows, 10 years. Ashley Boyd has been pregnant the entire time Henry has been in Storybrooke and has not had a child once. It's so... Henry Mills lived in a horror movie. Henry Mills lived in a horror movie and had to just slowly come to the realization that he was living in a horror movie and nobody else would acknowledge it because the whole town was the horror movie. Like, the more that I think about how Henry grew up in this town that's, like, charmed and cursed and confused, the more I understand why he is like that. He was handed an explanation. It's a book of fairy tales, but it's a book of fairy tales where all of the pictures look like the people he knows and has an explanation. It's not an explanation that makes sense in our current world, but neither does the rest of his life. Of course he jumped on that as the true reason behind it all. You would too. They don't even really address the fact that there's kids here and that makes it all so much weirder and worse. But it makes it so much weirder and worse. <sighs> anyway, also a stranger on a motorcycle comes to town. And Henry tells Emma that strangers don't come to Storybrooke, so now we have something else to deal with. Mary, Margaret, and David continue to have the world's weirdest infidelity flirtationship. She goes to Granny's every morning at exactly 7.15 so that she can watch him order his coffee. And he goes to Granny's every morning at exactly 7.15 so that he can see her while he orders his coffee. It's very silly. Like, Emma is just stuck watching her parents really weirdly pine for each other, and she doesn't even know that's what's happening. Mary Margaret sees Catherine Nolan shopping for a pregnancy test, and Regina sees her seeing that, and is like, you better not tell anybody about this. This is a secret. This is between them. It's, I don't know why Regina, <laughs> why Regina thinks Mary Margaret would go spilling. Mary Margaret finds a dove trapped and stuck and brings it to the animal rescue that David works at and is informed that the dove is fine, but if it doesn't get back to its flock before the big storm rolls in, it'll never find its flock again, and then it'll be alone forever and sad forever. So it's now her new life mission to get this dove back with its family because the dove is a metaphor, you see. I don't know if you were picking up on it. Um, Mary Margaret does a really bad job getting the dove back to its family and almost falls off of a cliff and dies. <laughs> she does a really bad job. And David has to show up to save her and pick her up off of the cliff. But the storm comes in and they have to go shelter in an abandoned cabin. And there was only one bed. <laughs> There wasn't. That's not it. But they do talk about their feelings. Uh, but then at one point, Mary Margaret is like, but we can't. Catherine's pregnant. David is like, Catherine is what? No, she's not. <laughs> what are you talking about? So yeah, Catherine's not pregnant. Uh, and after this whole storm, after they get the doves back to its little dove family, David goes to talk to Catherine uh, and agrees to go to couples therapy with her. They're going to also they're going to hang out with Archie and talk about all their problems. And as soon as they agree to that, David <laughs> runs off to go make out with Mary Margaret immediately. He's like, yeah, we can work things out in therapy. Absolutely. 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 I do have to go, though. <laughs> I do have to leave right now immediately. She's not pregnant. I don't know what to do with these two. I don't. I do not know what to do with them. <laughs> Regina demands that Emma figure out what the strangers do. I didn't put up the stranger. Here he is. No name for him yet, though. Emma goes and talks to him and asks what's in this big weird box he carries around, and it turns out it's a typewriter. And he still doesn't tell her his name. Uh, but he does convince her to get a drink with him sometime. So, Sheriff Graham who? It's all about this unnamed weirdo now. Backstory. Enchanted Forest backstory snow white is in love with prince charming <laughs> but prince charming is getting married to princess abigail so snow white thinks the logical conclusion here is to do something so that she can forget that prince charming even exists just fully forget about him and move on so who does she go to the only person anyone ever goes to rumpelstiltskin Rumpelstiltskin agrees to give her a forgetting potion, something 
we will be seeing more of in this show. The show loves it some forgetting potions. And the only thing that he asks for in return is a few strands of her hair. Don't trust that. He, oh, he just wants a few strands of hair. For what? Ask him for what. She doesn't. She just gives it to him. Prince Charming does not want to get married. He does not like Abigail. So he sends a message to Snow White asking her to come meet him. She does, but she is found by King George and all of his guards. And he says, hey, if you don't break my son's heart, if you don't go to him and say you never loved him and you came here to let him down <laughs> and say you can never see each other again, um, I'm not going to kill you. I'm going to kill him. <laughs> He's like, yeah, I'm ready to fully be down both sons. I don't need either son. I already lost one. I'll lose another one. The other one sucked, and I'm, this one's not doing what I'm asking him to. So, meh. Sons. Am I right? Snow White says, all right. Okay. And she breaks Prince Charming's heart and leaves. You know that I know that you love me too. I don't. Love you. I don't. While on this adventure, for a short time, Snow White does end up in jail, where she meets Grumpy, who is also in jail for some sort of crime. I don't even think we find out what. They are sprung from jail by Stealthy. You know the dwarf Stealthy? One of the eight dwarves? No? Oh, that's because he died after springing Grumpy and Snow White out of jail. You don't remember that part? Stealthy the Dwarf. Oh, if that doesn't sink your stomach as soon as you hear the name, you're like, oh, no way he sticks around, huh? <laughs> anyway, that only matters because after Snow White breaks Prince Charming's heart, she reconnects with the mourning dwarves who are mourning the loss of their brother, Stealthy, um, and she decides to stay with them. And Grumpy tries to convince her not to take this forgetting potion because the suffering makes them who they are, and he's lost love as well. No context for that yet. We'll get there. He's lost love as well. Um, but she does. She does take the forgetting potion. And she forgets Prince Charming exists, which is a real shame because Charming calls off his wedding and is ready to scour the kingdom to find her. That's going to be awkward. And it is. But before we can learn more about what happens with Snow White and Prince Charming, we need to learn the magic mirrors backstory. And I, I need to be so honest with you. I hate his backstory so bad. It makes me really upset. I can't put my finger on exactly which part of it I find so unsettling and upsetting. It's all of it, I think. So good King Leopold, father of Snow White and world's best and nicest man in the Enchanted Forest, finds a magic genie lamp and out of it comes a genie. And that's Sid. He's a, he's the genie, like Aladdin's genie, the genie. He was getting jealous of everybody else who got more than two names. So he's also the genie now. But King Leopold wants for nothing. He does not want to make any wishes. So he tells the genie that his first wish is to free the genie. And his second wish is to give his third wish to the genie. So the genie can have a wish. And now the genie lives with him because like... Where else do you go? You're a genie who's lived in a lamp your whole life, and then this really nice man gives you a wish and your freedom, and it's like, also, do you want to crash in my castle? Yes, I do. Thank you. And King Leopold introduces the genie to his beautiful wife, Regina, and the genie falls in love instantly. Okay. Regina is jealous of people admiring young Snow White. That's hilarious. That's a child. Uh, and the genie tries to sort of reassure her by saying she's the fairest in the land. And he gives her a mirror. But King Leopold finds that mirror and some entries in his wife's diary implying that somebody gave her that mirror and that person is lovely, that she loves that person. And King Leopold tells his good friend Jeannie, you must find this man. You must find this man who wants to steal my wife from me. Help me take this man down. And the genie goes, sir, yes, sir. Absolutely, I will find that. <laughs> I'll get him. Don't you worry, boss. <laughs> Regina 
is deeply unhappy and has her father, her father, Henry Mills, not this Henry Mills, her father, Henry Mills, bring her a box containing two incredibly venomous vipers from Agrabah, the genie's homeland. And it is her intention, she says, to use them to herself to get out of here um, by having them bite her. And the genie goes, whoa, 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 Uh, what if, what if, what if, what if, we don't do that. (laughs) And we use them on the king because he's making you so sad. And she goes, you would kill the king for me? And he says, of course I would. I would be honored to kill the king for you. You're so pretty. So he uses the vipers to get rid of the king. The king's last words is that he never should have freed the genie, that he regrets ever being nice to him. Uh, And then the genie goes back to Regina and is like, I did it. And Regina's like, okay, well, the guards uh, suspect you of the murder because the vipers are from your homeland and who else would have access to those. So you need to go. You need to leave. They're going to come get you. And he realizes, oh, that was her plan. That was her plan the whole time. Um, So instead of leaving the mean lady that just convinced him to do a crime and then trying to just get him to leave, he uses his wish, the wish that King Leopold gave him, and his wish is to never leave Regina's side, which then transports him into her mirror because he forgot the genie forgot that you need to be very careful in how you word genie wishes i wish to be by her side forever you are lucky you are not fused to her physically so now he's a mirror i hate his backstory so bad every part of it i hate it (laughs) and then in the real world okay the real world emma swan is working with sydney to find dirt on regina and they realize okay that there is fifty thousand dollars missing from the city's budget So they decide to figure out what it's going towards. Regina has Henry's uh, castle, his like little escape wooden playground torn down. And now his book is missing. He's freaking out. She's just being rude. Emma and Sydney are on the case about something seemingly unrelated. Emma goes to try and find a contact in the middle of the woods and on her way, her brakes fail. Someone cut her brakes, which is awful because do you know how hard it is to find replacement parts for a 1972 VW Super Beetle? Because I know how hard it is to find replacement parts for a 1972 VW Super Beetle. I once used up half of the available 1972 VW Super Beetle windshields in an entire state over the course of a weekend because we had to we had to replace the windshield and then the one we bought to be our replacement broke so we needed to get a second one and there were only four <laughs> in the entire state but at the end of the day they find out that Regina was using that $50,000 to build a new playground a safe playground for all the children of Storybrook but she just hadn't told anyone about it who built it whatever and it's never brought up again and Emma has nothing on her, no dirt. She can't pin the, the brake cutting on her. She has nothing because Sydney's the one who cut her brakes. Sydney is still working for Regina. He is so in her pocket. He's been working with Regina the whole time. Sydney, get up. Stand up. <laughs> she doesn't love you, dude. She is using you. Please get up. Please leave. Go, go, go. I have come to the realization I'm going to have to split recording this in half. I don't have time to finish explaining season one right now. I'm only halfway through it. Um, and I have things to do. I'm getting married in two days. <laughs> I will come back in a different outfit, I guess. So, you know, enjoy this one while it's here. All my feathers are getting so ruined by my arms existing. I have to take a break, but for you, it's gonna be like nothing. Ready, ready, ready? What? New fit check. Just a little guy. Just a little princeling. I know it looks like Steed Bonnet. I don't need you to tell me that. But actually, I will have you know that I am not a pirate. I'm a prince. A freshly married prince. Thank you. All right, couple of little updates. I forgot to label Rumpelstiltskin as the dark one. That's like his main name. I fixed it. He's the dark one now. And I also wanted to check in on our family tree since I did it like an idiot last time. Here we go. This shows you a little bit how weird it is that Regina adopted Henry, right? Snow White, 
daughter of Leopold and a queen. Leopold later remarried Regina, who adopted Henry, who is Snow White's grandson. So Regina is Henry Mills's step-great-grandmother slash mother. This costume is already falling apart. This part is, is not attached. There's not sleeves in there. It's all pretensies. Um, and it's made out of, I swear to God, felt. But we're going to get through this. I look good. The last things I discussed with you were exactly halfway through season one. Okay, so now we have the back half of season one to still discuss. And I think we can all agree that the one thing the show has been missing so far is a love interest for Rumpelstiltskin. Were you not thinking that? <laughs> also, okay, uh, hey, so speaking of Rumpelstiltskin, <laughs> I really, really love Rumpelstiltskin, okay? I think he is so fun. I love his silly little giggle. I love the way that he moves and how perfectly he kind of embodies the conniving trickster. Uh, I am not personally attracted to the scaly lizard man, and I need you to know that. Okay, I want to be him. I want to sit him down at a coffee shop and have him try to fool me into a bad deal. I do not want to be romantically pursued by him. However, this is not the case for a lot of people. A lot of people want this middle-aged man carnally. They want him biblically. I think it's mostly the scaly version, but there is also a lot of appreciation out there for the standard issue, Mr. Gold. Um, so honestly and genuinely, I, I think the show did a great thing by, by giving him a love interest. I don't even know if they knew at the time that that was such a good thing that they were doing for their audience. But I think they really, they really cashed into something giving him someone to be in love with. I haven't told you who it is yet. I'm getting there. Also, as we go through the show, you will probably notice that the character who gets the most action this whole show, I believe is Mr. Gold. Like, I think he outpaces Emma. At some point, characters are just throwing themselves at him. And I don't, I, it's the confidence, I assume, the competence as well. You will notice it as we go. And good for him. Good for him. In the Enchanted Forest, there is a town called Avonlea, ruled by Sir Maurice. And it's under attack during the Ogre Wars. <laughs> Belle! Belle is my favorite Disney princess, okay? I was immediately biased when she showed up. And I love her at first. <laughs> Rumpelstiltskin wants Belle to come with him back to his dark castle as like a live-in servant. He needs someone to clean his house for him. And he's chosen her. Uh, she agrees very quickly. They will all live. You have my word. And you have mine. I will go with you forever. Deal not! But her current fiancé Gaston and her father Maurice are pretty upset with that deal, understandably. I would also be upset <laughs> in that situation. After Belle moves into Rumpelstiltskin's dark castle, she's initially living in the dungeons and is honestly not very great at taking care of a castle. Uh, she chips a teacup, you know, like, like Chip from the animated Beauty and the Beast movie. She also at one point falls backwards off of a ladder and Rumpelstiltskin has to dramatically catch her and save her and they make very charged eye contact as he's holding her and it's it's so immediately apparent what they are doing here. Belle is immediately of the belief that the guy who showed up to her house to offer protection against ogres in exchange for her literal life and servitude is actually a great guy with hidden depths and a good heart. No one's told her this. She has no reason to believe this, except that he didn't let her break her spine falling off a ladder or, like, grievously injure her over chipping a cup. Gaston, her previous fiancé, does show up to try and rescue her at some point from the monster that stole her away and is locking her up in a castle. Uh, but Rumpelstiltskin turns Gaston into a rose and then gives that rose to Belle as a little gift. He does not tell her 
that the Rose is her ex-fiance. And in fact, I don't think she ever finds out. After some amount of time, uh, honestly, it didn't seem like that long that she was in his castle in this episode. But um, spoilers, I guess, for later on in the show. The show loves having flashbacks <laughs> to this time period where Belle was living in Rumpelstiltskin's dark castle, like, before they were in love. And so it, I, it must have been a long time. But we do not get any real idea of, of scale here. Anyway, like I was saying, after some time, Rumpelstiltskin agrees to let Belle go into town. And he admits in that conversation that he expects to never see her again now that he is permitting her to leave. But, you know, he's in love and he can't trap her here against her will. That's, I guess that's what love is. Belle does leave to go into town, and on her journey, she runs into the evil queen, Regina, and divulges a little bit about her situation, just enough that Regina knows that Belle is shacking up with Rumpelstiltskin. And Regina, just sort of casually, lets Belle know that, well, any, any curse can be broken by true love's kiss. Any curse at all. You know, if, if perhaps you were experiencing true love with somebody suffering the effects of perhaps some curse making them into a weird scaly monster, that could, you, it might work because any curse, you know, if that was your situation, I'm not saying that it is. <laughs> so, of course, Belle runs back to Rumpelstiltskin and she kisses him, making that Dark One's curse begin to fade, confirming that, yes, this is real Magically confirmed true love, which is crazy, but okay. Belle is overjoyed that this is working, and she mentions that she said that it would work, which was the wrong thing to say, because now Rumpelstiltskin believes that Belle is working for the evil queen to get rid of his curse and render him powerless, because no one could truly love a monster like Rumpelstiltskin. Even though this is true love's kiss my man, if it wasn't, it wouldn't work. It's working as intended. Uh, so he throws her in the dungeons again. He's pretty mad about that. Right up until he demands that she leaves forever because he doesn't want her anymore. He doesn't want her around. He doesn't want to see her. He doesn't want her in his life. No more. She calls him a coward and leaves because that's what you do when you're in love. At some unspecified point in the future, Regina shows up to Rumpelstiltskin's dark castle to talk some business dealings, and Rumpelstiltskin accuses her of having something to do with Belle's situation. To which Regina responds that she had no part in Belle's death. That's not what he was talking about. He was just saying, it's your fault my girlfriend betrayed me. And she says, well, your dead girlfriend's not my problem. According to Regina in this conversation, Belle ran away and went home. And nobody back in Avonlea wanted anything to do with her. They wouldn't touch her. They wouldn't have her engaged to anyone else because of her association with Rumpelstiltskin. She was assumed cursed, tainted, ruined. Her father shunned her, cut her off, shut her out. So she needs a home. And they locked her up in a tower and tortured and exercised her? until it was too much for her to bear and she threw herself out the window to her demise. That's horrifying. And as Rumpelstiltskin takes in this information and begins to break down this evil, sadistic sorcerer fully falling to pieces in front of her, Regina makes a mean comment about how Rumpelstiltskin's castle is dirty and he needs to get a new maid. And then leaves him there! Here's something fun. Rumpelstiltskin needs another goddamn name. <laughs> He's the beast. Like of beauty and. At some point, we're not going to be able to see his face anymore. This man collects nomenclature like it's his goddamn job. In the real world, Mr. Gold has his memories back, including all of his memories of Belle. And he's not handling it, um... Well, 
Mr. Gold repossesses the work van of the real-life counterpart of Sir Maurice Bell's father here in Storybrooke, Maine. He is Mo French. Because the Beauty and the Beast fairy tale came from France. Mo French is a florist. He needs this van for work. Also, his florist shop is called Game of Thorns. The show crushes it with the names. Mo French is not pleased that Mr. Gold repossessed his van and responds by breaking into Mr. Gold's house and stealing from him second time this season. <laughs> People <laughs> have just brazenly stolen from Mr. Gold. Emma Swan, sheriff and local superhero, does get most of his stuff back, but there is still apparently one thing missing, so Mr. Gold goes after Mo himself. He... Literally, ties Mo up with duct tape and holds him at gunpoint. Like, it is so much for no reason. He starts beating the man with his cane, yelling about she is gone and it's your fault and things that make no sense to Mo. No sense to Mo. Mo does not even think he's ever had a daughter. <laughs> and that is how Emma Swan finds them. And she has to stop Gold from literally ending Mo's life then and there. So unsurprisingly, Gold gets um, arrested for this. Emma has him locked up in the sheriff's station where Regina shows up to talk to him. Regina has finally realized that it's like in her favor that Emma and Henry want to be around each other all the time because she can just say, hey, Emma, Henry wants ice cream. Go. And then she can just have the sheriff's station to herself. Regina and Gold have a very tense conversation where they both admit that they remember their enchanted forest identities. Tell me your name. Rumpelstiltskin. And it turns out that Regina is the one who was behind Mo breaking into Gold's place. Like, it was her idea. And she gives Gold the one item that was still missing. A chipped teacup. After leaving Gold behind bars, Regina goes to visit a psychiatric hospital in Storybrooke, Maine, where it is revealed that Belle has been alive, locked up beneath Storybrooke this entire time. For 28 years? So, no surprise, the evil queen lied to Rumpelstiltskin. Why would she not have? Why did he in no way suspect it was a lie? That's just what grief does to you, baby. I don't know. Belle is alive. Belle is in Storybrooke. And nobody knows it but Regina. Also, random tidbits that are in the Belle episode for some reason. Uh, David Nolan buys two cards for Valentine's Day and gives the wrong one to Mary Margaret, the one that is addressed to his wife. Uh, Mary Margaret, Ruby, and Ashley Boyd are all friends. It's very sweet. They, like, go out and they drink together. And also, Sean proposes to Ashley and she says yes. I love Ashley Boyd. I can't explain why. I just think she's so sweet. And every time we get a scene of her happy, it lights up my heart. She is such a minor character. <laughs> After all of our bell revelations, our bellovations... We're back in the infidelity arc. Basically, in the enchanted forest, Prince Charming called off his wedding to Abigail, and Abigail was not mad about it at all. Uh, in fact, she finds him and says that, I know you're in love with Snow White. I know, I know. I'm not in love with you either. Neither of us was going to be happy here. <laughs> Princess Abigail was actually in love with a man named Frederick, a soldier, a knight, who is currently a gold statue, uh, which happened to him while he was saving Midas's life. Midas accidentally touched him, and he became begolded, and he's stuck like this. And because of that layer of gold, she can't get to him for true love's kiss to break him free. So Abigail needs special curse-breaking water from Lake Nostos, and Charming agrees to go get it for her, because Charming's a very nice guy. And the two of them are just both stuck in a bad situation here. Lake Nostos is protected by a siren, Charming kills it and he gets water and he brings it back to Abigail. <laughs> Princess Abigail is now free to marry her actual real true love, Frederick, and Charming goes to find Snow White, who at this point, if you recall, has erased all of her memories of Prince Charming. <laughs> he doesn't know that, but ah! Catherine Nolan is not happy in the real world 
either she has decided to go to law school in Boston. She thinks her and David should both go as a fresh start. But what she doesn't know is that David and Mary Margaret are still meeting up all the time. David insists that he is choosing Mary Margaret, to which Mary Margaret says, okay, can you tell your wife that, please? You can't, please. And David does tell Catherine that he can't go to Boston. He can't do it. And he kind of breaks it off with her that way. But he does not mention Mary Margaret at all in that conversation. I would give that a three out of 10 on doing what you were asked to do. Catherine is pretty upset that her husband has announced that he's leaving her and talks to her I guess only friend about it, Regina. And Regina shows Catherine pictures that Sidney Glass has taken of David and Mary Margaret together. Canoodling! So what does Catherine do, woman scorned? That's right, she goes to Mary Margaret's place of work, an elementary school, and slaps her in front of God and everybody. It yells at her for breaking up her marriage, which also lets Mary Margaret know that David didn't even tell Catherine. Catherine found out a different way. This leads to Mary Margaret getting slut-shamed in the streets. Granny is telling her she needs to be ashamed of herself. And basically the whole town is very mad that Mary Margaret has done this. She's a homewrecker now. So Mary Margaret breaks it off with David, saying that what they have is not love, that it's destructive, and that it's not good for either of them. Emma goes for that drink that she promised with the motorcycle typewriter stranger in town, and he finally tells us his name. It's August Booth. August takes Emma to a well in the middle of the woods and tells her that the water there is magic and that she needs to have faith, and she thinks he's crazy and goes home to comfort a very distraught, just so sad Mary Margaret. We do also see August adding pages to Henry's book that I guess he took from Henry's castle before it was torn down. It does get back to Henry in this episode, but what are you doing with that? Catherine Nolan decides to leave for Boston on her own. If David won't go with her, if David is not happy with her, she can still be happy. And she leaves a letter to David telling him that he can also be happy and that he should find that happiness with Mary Margaret. Regina breaks into the Nolan household and steals and burns that letter. And what happens every time somebody tries to leave Storybrooke? That's right. Catherine crashes her car. <laughs> but her car is found empty. Not a Catherine in sight. Bum, bum, bum! Emma Swan has to go confront David Nolan as he is a suspect in Catherine's disappearance. I would say understandably so, but there's not enough evidence to charge him with anything, so he is still a free man. Which leaves the main suspect, I guess, as Mary Margaret. But Mary Margaret is very busy at this time. <laughs> Putting a festival together. It's that time of year in Storybrooke, Maine. It's time for Miner's Day. A day and a festival to celebrate the miners. E-R, not O. -R, like people who mine. There's mines beneath Storybrooke. But no one will help Mary Margaret with Miner's Day preparations because of that whole affair thing and how nobody likes her anymore. Except for Leroy! Which means we get a lot of what's actually one of my favorite dynamics, which is Snow White and Grumpy, uh, Mary Margaret and Leroy. They are just so delightful together. I love Leroy. Leroy agrees to help, not even because he likes Mary Margaret, but because he really likes Astrid. Astrid is a nun. Storybrooke has nuns. There's a whole convent. And Astrid accidentally spends all of the nuns' money on helium tanks. They only needed a few for Miner's Day and she did math wrong and she's bought all of them and rent is due next week. And if the nuns don't sell every single candle that they have made to sell for Miner's Day, Mr. Gold will evict them because Gold hates the nuns, which is hilarious both with and without Enchanted Forest context. I'll give you the context soon, I promise. Uh, but yeah, Leroy's hot for the nun. She is a nun, Leroy. Could you possibly pick anyone any less available? Says the girl who went after a married guy? So Mary Margaret and Leroy go door to door trying to sell candles, but nobody likes either of them. I would buy their candles. I would buy all their candles. 
Leroy even tries to sell his boat to Mr. Gold to get the nuns the money that they need, but Gold literally won't buy it because he refuses <laughs> to give him money that's going to go to the nuns. This man hates those nuns. But in the end, they sell all the candles with the power of property destruction and electrical tampering. What are you doing? I'm selling candles, sister. Leroy makes all the lights go out at the festival, so everybody needs to buy the candles if they want a single light source. And Granny lights Mary Margaret's candle for her, showing that I guess all is forgiven? I don't know. It's sweet. Here's that enchanted forest context that I promised you. Uh, dwarves are hatched out of eggs. The dwarves in the enchanted forest come from egg. They're hatched out of egg. And there's no female dwarves, not a one. All the dwarves are male, okay? Every dwarf is boy dwarf, and they are hatched out of egg. And I don't n know where the egg come from. Egg, egg full human size, full dwarf size, not small. Full, full six foot egg size, where egg come from? How get dwarf egg? Apparently dwarves do not fall in love. They do not have children. So the egg, how, how egg? How egg? Other things that we all know about dwarves. Dwarves are about the same size as regular human men. Little short, they're like five, four, five, five. Dwarves are born fully clothed. Dwarves don't get sick. Dwarves are assigned a single personality trait by a magic axe. They are named for that personality trait and they are expected to abide by it their entire life. Like it's divergent. Grumpy is not born named Grumpy. When he is hatched from egg and handed magic axe, the axe proclaims him to be named Dreamy as his egg was covered in fairy dust and he was born full of dreams. Dreamy meets Nova, a careless, beautiful fairy that he instantly falls in love with. That's Astrid. Nova is Astrid. Oh, also the blue fairy it leads the nuns in the real world. I forgot to tell you that. She's mother superior in the real world. The fairies all became nuns. I don't know why, but that's why Mr. Gold hates them because Rumpelstiltskin hated the fairies. But it's really funny that that man just goes around publicly hating nuns so bad. Dreamy explores the outside world and ends up in a tavern where he meets Belle? When in her timeline is this? I don't know, but she tells Dreamy all about love. So it's gotta be after Rumpelstiltskin, right? It's gotta be. And with his head full of ideas about love, Dreamy sneaks off to run away with Nova, and his brothers are all so happy for him. But the Blue Fairy tells him that if they do this, if Nova and Dreamy go off together, Nova will lose her wings, that she will lose an essential part of her. And they also tell him that he's not actually in love. This is an infatuation. This is childish. This will pass. But I think I don't think he believes that at all. He just doesn't want her to lose her wings. Not for him. So he and Nova give up on their dreams and he goes back to the mines. And in his anger, he breaks his magic axe and needs to get a new one. And the new axe renames him Grumpy. Because he's given up on his dreams. Hey, I bet you haven't guessed who Ruby is in the Enchanted Forest yet, have you? What? It was obvious. <laughs> she was Little Red Riding Hood the whole time? What? Damn right she was. And Little Red Riding Hood is very good friends with Snow White. Little Red Riding Hood's backstory is pretty short and sweet. Here we go. So Little Red Riding Hood is a werewolf. But she does not know that because the red hood that she wears blocks her curse and keeps her from transforming. But one night, she doesn't wear it and murders a bunch of guys. Does not remember it when she wakes up. Has no memories of this happening. And the way that the scene is set up by all of the, the viscera and things, it kind of looks like the wolf, the monster, was her boyfriend, Peter. So Snow White helps Little Red Riding Hood tie Peter up so that Red can watch over him until morning and keep him safe. 
that does not go well. That awkward moment when you turn into a man-killing monster and you kill your man. Am I right? That's it. That's it. That's her backstory. And in the real world in Storybrooke, Ruby quits her job at Granny's and wants to leave town. Because it's gone so well for everyone else who's tried to leave. But Emma and Mary Margaret actually convinced Ruby to just stay with them for a little bit. If you're arguing with your grandmother, you don't have to leave the only place you've ever known. You can just come crash in my apartment. It's okay. Henry tries to help Ruby job search, and she ends up being Emma's secretary and assistant for a little bit. I didn't know sheriffs had those. But Emma sends Ruby to go check out the scene of Catherine's disappearance. And Ruby is drawn to a spot. She doesn't know why. It's these extraordinary senses that she never realized she had. And she finds a box containing a human heart. This box is Mary Margaret's old jewelry box, and it has her fingerprints on the outside of it, clearly set up to say, Mary Margaret did this. She took out somebody's heart, put it in a box, and then buried that box. If this really was Mary Margaret that did this, what a weird way to do a crime, huh? Didn't even put on gloves? You used a box that is clearly yours? Ruby realizes she actually wants nothing to do with a career that involves opening boxes full of human hearts and goes back to work with Granny, who tells Ruby that she wants Ruby to take over the business someday. That's why she pushes her. The episode where we get Little Red Riding Hood, Ruby backstory, where she becomes like an actual character with thoughts and feelings and wants and desires, suddenly... Suddenly, she's fully clothed. The whole time. The whole episode. She's very clothed. She's got a really, like, distinct sense of style, which she's had at bits and pieces over the season. Occasionally, they, she wears full pants. But all of a sudden, when we let her talk, that's when we let her... <sighs> I'm happy for her. I'm happy for her. It only makes me mad because I really love her. I just want her to be treated well. So David is experiencing new and more memory loss. All he knows is he's looking for his wife, which is fair. He's looking for uh, both of them, technically. But now people think Mary Margaret disappeared Catherine. So she's taken in for booking and questioning. She has mug shots now. (laughs) Emma is looking for evidence that Mary Margaret didn't do it because she fully does not believe that Mary Margaret is capable of doing something like this. Uh, So she searches the apartment that they have been sharing where Henry finds her. He ditches school. I guess who's who's teaching him? They gotta have substitutes in Storybrooke. Henry ditches school. (laughs) And they search the apartment together uh, where Emma finds a hunting knife beneath the floorboard that could have been the murder weapon. How did it get there? Mr. Gold tells Mary Margaret that he will be her legal counsel. And when she says that she can't pay him, she's a school teacher, she doesn't have lawyer money, he says he doesn't need anything from her. Don't trust that. We should all know better. Disregarding the fact that he's technically Rumpelstiltskin, she doesn't know that. You just shouldn't trust Mr. Gold like that. Henry, for his part, fully believes that his adopted mother framed his teacher for murder. And that's the evidence he is hunting for. He steals Regina's keys, which proves that she has a key to Mary Margaret's apartment and could have planted the evidence and stolen the jewelry box at the same time. That's pretty damning. Emma receives back DNA proof that the heart in the box is Catherine Nolan's. And because of that, the case against Mary Margaret will continue. She's like the only suspect right now because of how obvious and blatant the evidence they have discovered is. Emma does discuss with Gold that Emma also believes Regina framed Mary Margaret. She doesn't have proof of it. She does believe it. While everybody else is trying to solve this crime, David Nolan undergoes hypnosis with Archie, Archibald Hopper, to try and remember what happened the night that Catherine disappeared. Because his fancy new memory loss, he doesn't remember the night at all. Instead of remembering what happened in Storybrooke, he unlocks memories of the Enchanted Forest and remembers himself yelling, don't kill her, to a woman that looks just like Mary Margaret, but with long hair. So he asks Mary Margaret, did you kill my wife? (laughs) 
<laughs> she doesn't take it well. And then alone in her cell in the sheriff's office, Mary Margaret finds that somebody has left her a key. And she lets herself out and runs into the woods. So where did that enchanted forest memory that David just got back, where did that come from? Let me tell you about it. After Snow White erased Prince Charming from her memories, the dwarves staged an intervention led by Jiminy Cricket because ever since she drank that potion, she's been really mean to them. <laughs> You broke my mug! You're lucky it wasn't that mug you call a face! Snow White decides that what she needs to do is kill the source of her anger, the evil queen, so that she stops taking those feelings out on the dwarves. And Grumpy goes, oh, what if we did something else? <laughs> so Grumpy takes her to the only person anyone ever goes to, say it with me, Rumpelstiltskin, hoping that maybe Rumpelstiltskin can reverse the effects of that forgetting potion. Turns out, no, Rumpelstiltskin cannot reverse the effects. And Snow White says, that's fine. Uh, she actually agreed to come here and meet him because she just wanted to get something from him. She wanted something that could kill the evil queen, please. Thank you. So Rumpelstiltskin gives her a bow that never misses. And she's off to the races. And what does Rumpelstiltskin want in return? Nothing. Don't trust like that. And then Prince Charming goes to the only person anyone ever goes to. Say it with me, Rumpelstiltskin. And he learns that the only way to reverse the potion that Snow took is true love's kiss. And he also learns that if Snow White does successfully kill the evil queen, then her heart will be evil forever. Surely that's not how it works. <laughs> Charming does find Snow White before she gets to Regina, and he kisses her. But she does not know who he is, and certainly is not in love with him. So Snow ties him to a tree and Jiminy Cricket finds him and breaks him out? Okay. So then Charming finds Snow White again, just in time to thwart an assassination attempt, taking the arrow himself. He says he couldn't bear to see her heart darkened, and she kisses him, and the spell breaks, because they're in love. And out of literally nowhere, King George appears and drags Prince Charming away. And Snow White swears that she will find him. <laughs> I will always find you. These two are always yelling about finding each other, and I love that for them. I love the determination. I just think, maybe, the universe is telling y'all something. So that's the memory that David got back was at that assassination attempt. He's yelling, don't kill her. It was about Regina, not about Catherine Nolan. Deep in the enchanted forest, I believe long, long before, anything else we have discussed about the enchanted forest to this point there is a man named jefferson sebastian stan sebastian stan is in this show yeah ladies and gentlemen that is a pre-marvel cinematic universe sebastian stan barely pre-marvel cinematic universe this was 2011 sebastian stan playing jefferson Okay. Jefferson is a single father. We meet him as he's playing with his daughter, Grace, when the evil queen, Regina, shows up to ask for a favor, offering him a lot of money to help her retrieve something. But he says no, because he has a daughter to look after now. He does not want to be involved in evil queen shenanigans. Thank you. He's very happy. Later at a market, his daughter Grace asks for a stuffed rabbit that she sees, but it is too expensive and Jefferson can't afford it. Grace is super understanding about it. She doesn't push. She's not crying. She's not visibly upset. She's very mature. And after the pair leaves, the stuffed rabbit seller reveals herself to be the evil queen in disguise, just trying to make Jefferson feel bad about not being able to provide for his daughter, even though they are literally doing just fine. And she wasn't mad. And Jefferson makes his own rabbit doll for her, by the way, because he's perfect. And yet, Jefferson leaves his home behind, promising Grace he'll be back. He leaves her alone. She's like 11 or 12, but he leaves her alone in the woods. But he does promise that he'll be back. And we all know what that means for him. So Jefferson goes to Regina, bringing with him a magical realm-traveling top hat, revealing himself to be the Mad Hatter. I forgot to put him on the board. I was too busy yelling about how he was Sebastian Stan. 
that I did put him on the board. He's the Mad Hatter. We're doing Alice in Wonderland now. You thought it was just fairy tales? It's also Alice in Wonderland now. So the Mad Hatter and the Evil Queen go to Wonderland. The Mad Hatter does not like Wonderland, but he is willing to do this so that Regina can get something. She's an errand to run. The rule of the hat, Jefferson lets us know, is that however many people enter the hat to go realm traveling is how many people can leave. And in fact, how many people need to leave. So if two people go through, two people must go back. You can't take more, but you also can't go back with less, which would be fine if the thing that Regina needed wasn't her father. But lo, her father, Henry, is here. He was kidnapped by the Queen of Hearts. The plan all along was to abandon Jefferson, never to return to get him, so that Regina and her father, Henry, could make it home safely. They really set up Regina's father, Henry, at the very beginning to be just sort of a a nice man who would do anything for his daughter and overlooks her flaws. But the more we see of him... What an inexcusable pushover of a worm. He just lets them leave Jefferson there, says nothing. No qualms. Jefferson is yelling about his daughter, about how Regina knows that his daughter's waiting for him. And Henry is just like, that's not my problem. I do miss my house. Sir, I just wish he would ever speak up. The Queen of Hearts has Jefferson beheaded, but he survives and his head is reattached right away. So I don't really know what the point of that was. And Jefferson is left to try and get it to work to make a new hat that can get him home in an endless room filled with his fruitless efforts. But hey, we have not seen this man in Storybrooke before. It's not like this is giving us context to a man that has been around. This is a new man. Where did he come from? Emma Swan realizes that Mary Margaret is gone and goes to search for her in the woods, and in doing so, nearly hits a man with her car. That man, of course, is Jefferson. She says that she's looking for her dog uh, and gives Jefferson a ride home to his very, very big, lonely mansion out in the woods. She goes in to see a map of the area to hopefully help her find her dog, Uh, And Jefferson drugs her tea, and she passes out. So this is why we haven't seen Jefferson yet, because he's a lonely, creepy forest hermit. Emma wakes up alone and restrained, but manages to break free and finds evidence that Jefferson has been low-key stalking her ever since she's arrived in Storybrooke. There's, like, pictures of her around town. There's evidence of her whereabouts and how she moves. While looking around, Emma also finds Mary Margaret bound, restrained in a separate room and unties her until Jefferson finds them and holds them at gunpoint until Emma reties up Mary Margaret. Because Jefferson needs Emma to do something for him. Because you see, Jefferson has an extra special curse. He is living under slightly different rules than everyone else in Storybrooke. Jefferson remembers everything. He fully understands the horror movie that everyone is living in and has been living in Frozen for 28 years. He is trapped in a land with no magic and no daughter because here Grace is Paige and Paige doesn't know who he is. She lives with two brand new parents. She's very happy. She is well taken care of and she does not know him. He has all of his fairy tale memories. He remembers trying to get back to her for decades, if not centuries, driving himself mad, making hat after hat after hat, hoping to finally find the one that would magically get him back to her. And when he finally sees her again, it's in a world entirely new, entirely unfamiliar, and she doesn't recognize him. So Jefferson demands that Emma Swan make him a magic hat so that he can take his daughter and go home. Emma is, of course, unsuccessful in doing this and does not believe a single word that Jefferson says, though I do believe she is getting suspicious that so many people seem to be on whatever train her son Henry has found himself aboard. Because surely Henry has not been talking to this weird, creepy forest hermit. 
So how did the weird, creepy forest hermit get to the same conclusion Henry did? Anyway, instead of confronting that, Emma manages to sneak behind Jefferson and knock him out with his own telescope, which is also where she notices a scar fully encircling his neck. Really cool that his beheading scar stuck around for him. I, it's actually a really sexy scar placement that kind of bangs. <laughs> I'm sure he doesn't like it, though. <laughs> Mary Margaret gets free, knocks Jefferson out a window, and he vanishes into thin air. And all that is left where he supposedly landed is the hat that Emma was working on. So is he magic or... Mary Margaret goes back to her cell where Regina is so mad to find her there because it was Rumpelstiltskin's idea for Regina to plant that key out of the cell so that Mary Margaret would escape out of her cell and then get in super extra trouble for escaping jail. That was the plan? <laughs> but Rumpelstiltskin, he's not Rumpelstiltskin here, Mr. Gold assures Regina that things will still work out. They'll still get what they want. These two are so silly. Regina and Gold, they hate each other so bad, but they will not stop trying to work <laughs> together on different things. They just need to ignore each other. They need to move all the way across the earth. I know that they can't. They're stuck in Storybrooke, but I think they would just each be much happier if they sort of ruled their own separate small towns. Emma looks in Henry's big book of fairy tales and finds a picture of Jefferson with his daughter Grace, which should, to me, be the thing that breaks her and makes her believe in the fairy tale nonsense. That would, I think, that would be my breaking point. This man surely never spoke to Henry, is in no way influenced by the 10-year-old, still came to the same conclusion, and there is a picture of him and the daughter he claims to have had in this book. How are you still... <laughs> Even though Regina can't get Mary Margaret in super trouble because Mary Margaret went back to her cell, Regina can taunt Mary Margaret while she's behind bars, listing all of the evidence against her, saying you should just confess. Just say you did the crime. I know you didn't, but come on. It doesn't matter. Just confess. We're going to get you anyway. I don't deserve this. I did not kill Catherine. Oh, I know. Mary Margaret asks why Regina hates her so bad, because she, in this world, has no context for why the mayor <laughs> despises her. At the sheriff's office, Sidney Glass drops off flowers for Emma, assuring her that he's looking into everything. Emma still thinks that her and Sidney are on the same side here. And the district attorney arrives to interview Mary Margaret, and it's King George... His name's Albert Spencer here, but it, it's King George. Basically, Mary Margaret cannot catch a break. The two people in charge of if she's getting arrested are the people who hated her so bad in fairy tale land, even though she doesn't know that. Emma goes clue hunting with August Booth, even though he has spontaneously started having some difficulty walking. And they find a broken off bit of shovel kind of lodged in the ground where Ruby discovered the human heart in Mary Margaret's jewelry box. And then they find the rest of that broken shovel in Regina's garage, courtesy of Henry letting them into her house that he lives in so that they could search the garage. However, when Emma comes back with a warrant to officially do a search, the shovel is no longer broken. It, the broken one is gone, new shovel, which leads Emma to believe that August is working against her. August is working with Regina, clearly. He is not working with Regina, in fact, Emma discovers a listening device in the flowers that Sydney gave to her. So now she knows that Sydney's not on her side, and she goes to apologize to August, just in time for them and Ruby to discover Catherine Nolan alive in an alley. But also, it's about time that we figure out why Regina hated Snow White so bad. It's a really dumb reason. In the Enchanted Forest, when Regina was a young woman, her mother Cora was physically and emotionally abusive, but Regina still found joy in horseback riding and the stable boy, 
Daniel. They were in love. Regina can't tell her mother about their love because Cora wants to use Regina to climb the social ladder and have her marry up, as Cora is still upset that she was born a Miller's daughter herself and wasn't born into that sort of social privilege. Regina saves a little girl about 10 years old on a runaway horse, and that little girl is Snow White. I'm Snow. Snow White. Real quick, gotta talk about how amazing the casting is on Young Snow White. It's perfect. You couldn't have had a better Young Snow White if you time-traveled and got the adult actor but at age 10. It's crazy. It's so good. King Leopold himself, Snow White's father, visits to thank Regina for saving his daughter. And he proposes to Regina then and there because he's been looking for so long for someone who could love Snow White the way that she deserves. And Cora accepts the proposal on her behalf. So Regina and Daniel plan to run off together, and they make out in the stables, and Snow White sees them, running off in distress because Regina was supposed to be in love with her dad. What are you doing? You and my dad are getting married. Regina catches up to Snow White and explains that she's in love with Daniel, not Leopold. And Snow White agrees to keep it a secret. And she also agrees that Regina and Daniel should get married. Because that's true love. Cora, an emotionally manipulative and abusive adult, asks Snow White why Regina has been so distant lately. She's talking up how much she loves her daughter to a little girl who'd recently lost her mom. And Snow White spills the Daniel beans. Because Cora just says she wants Regina to be happy, that she would do anything to make Regina happy again. And Snow White's like, oh my gosh, I know what'd make her happy. She's doing her best. She can't lose her mother. No one should. So Cora stops Regina and Daniel from running away together and kills Daniel. So there is no longer an obstacle in the way of getting her daughter married to the king. Snow White confesses to Regina that it was Snow that spilled the beans. And Regina, passionlessly monotone, tells this child that she didn't really love Daniel. That it was just a passing phase and that she's very excited to be Snow White's stepmother. Important, Regina does not tell Snow White that Daniel died. She tells Snow White that Daniel left and is a non-issue. Snow White does not find out that Daniel died for a very, very long time. She genuinely does not know what happened for most of her life. She didn't even know why Regina was... Regina also realizes, somehow, that Cora coordinated all of this, starting from Snow White's runaway horse crossing their path where Regina saved her. How? And Regina finds herself wishing that she had just let that little girl get trampled by a horse. And I guess I get that as a feeling that you might have, as an instinct, as, a, oh, I just wish I'd never gotten into this situation. But to then continue to blame that little girl for years and years and decades and decades when it was, like, super your mom's fault at every turn? I, I guess I, I can't be that mad, but it also doesn't make a lot of sense. Not that grief ever does. So that's why the evil queen hates Snow White. That's why she blames Snow White for ruining her life. That's why she's made it her mission to destroy Snow White's happiness wherever possible. That's why all of this happened. That's why they're in Maine. Because a 10-year-old was manipulated. And Regina knew she was manipulated. <laughs> We're most of the way through the season, but there's still a few mysteries to figure out and a lot more to do. We need to go back to some Rumpelstiltskin backstory. In the Enchanted Forest, I wish I knew at what point in the timeline this occurred. I simply don't, and I don't think anyone does. Balefire is 14 years old, and 
not conscripted for the Ogre Wars. We're all very proud. Balefire is playing alone, kind of in the street, and he almost gets hit by a man driving a cart while he's chasing a ball. And the driver starts to get pretty upset because he had to, like, swerve to not hit this teenager. And then he realizes that it's Balefire. And he panics <laughs> because everybody knows who Balefire's father is. Rumpelstiltskin, fully the dark one, shows up and notices that his boy has a skinned knee. This man made his boy bleed. And so he turns the man into a snail and then crushes the snail, literally making his 14-year-old Witness him murder an innocent man as the 14-year-old begs for the man's life, begs for his father to let him go. His dad's like, so sorry, Bay. You, he made you bleed. Literally a situation that was objectively Balefire's fault for running into the road. So Bay does not like or trust or want magic. Literally at all. It's not improving his life, even though technically it kept him from dying in the Ogre Wars and actually ended the Ogre Wars. Rumpelstiltskin went ahead and ended the Ogre Wars. I think he just like dissolved all the ogres. Solved that problem. So Bay asks his father to please get rid of his scary magic powers. We, we fixed the Ogre Wars. I'm not in an army. Come on, Papa, we're all done here. We can turn the key, turn off the magic powers. But Rumpelstiltskin explains how the dagger works to Bay and lets him know that the only way the power is going away is if Rumpelstiltskin dies by someone stabbing him with it, and then that person will take the power instead. So they strike a deal that if Bay finds a way to get rid of the magic without killing Rumpelstiltskin or hurting Bay, Rumpelstiltskin will do it. He strikes that deal with his son. He makes that promise. And then the next day, Balefire walks in on his father cleaning up evidence that he killed their mute maid because she had overheard the conversation about how the dagger works. Rumpelstiltskin is such an unrepentant murderer. It's crazy. He's had these magic powers less than a year, and he's doing this shit. He was such a, a difficult-to-watch coward and then a switch flipped. And now his favorite hobby is ending lives. Balefire does what so many people do in the Enchanted Forest, which is run to the woods in desperate search of anyone who will tell them what to do. And he ends up summoning the Blue Fairy to ask for a way to rid his father of this power. The Blue Fairy confirms that there's not really a way to just get rid of the power from Rumpelstiltskin, but what she does give him is a magic bean that will take them to another realm. They could take them to a world without magic. And in a world without magic, there cannot exist a Dark One curse. So therefore, technically, it would get rid of the curse from his dad. The Blue Fairy also tells Bay that this is the very last magic bean that there is. Convenient. Balefire is super excited about this plan. He's all over it. His father is less sure because apparently according to him fairy magic and dark one magic don't mix but bay is like we made a deal so you don't get a choice let's go bay uses the magic bean successfully to open a portal to a land without magic but rumpelstiltskin does not follow him through and instead actually actively lets his son's hand go and watches him slip into a different dimension Alone. You coward! You promise! Don't break our deal! I have to! Rumpelstiltskin immediately regrets this choice. He's like clawing at the ground, trying to find the portal again, maybe to find Bay, I guess, just under the earth, just screaming and sobbing in the woods. And that is the only deal that Rumpelstiltskin has ever broken. It's so fucked up for both of them. And I guess, is that why Rumpelstiltskin wanted Cinderella's baby? 
He just wanted a new kid? I don't think that sounds right. I actually think that sounds very wrong. If he just wanted a different child, he could have gone any number of ways to do so. I think he just doesn't want anyone else to be allowed to love their kids. I didn't get to keep my son around because of all of my inherent flaws as a person, so why should you be allowed to have a daughter, huh? Back in Storybrooke, August Booth is acting super weird around Mr. Gold. He's like sneaking into the back rooms of Gold's pawn shop. He's generally just snooping around and being weird in his presence. He's putting out a lot of vibes and none of them are normal. Emma Swan continues to be in a completely different TV show and story than the rest of these people. She is on a mission to solve a crime still. She goes to Catherine Nolan in the hospital. Catherine doesn't remember much about what happened to her, but she does know enough to know that she was kept in a basement. So now Emma's quest is to find out who framed Mary Margaret. And everyone else is trying to drag her into this fairy tale nonsense. David and Kathy Nolan agree officially to end their relationship, that it wasn't going to work. And David tries to go to Mary Margaret's, uh, you're not going to jail party. But Emma turns him away at the door. Good friend. Good friend. Emma's trying to get all of her evidence together to officially pin this on Regina, that Regina framed Mary Margaret, Regina kidnapped Catherine. It's the only thing that makes sense. And then at the sheriff's office, Sidney Glass turns himself in. He confesses to everything, the kidnapping, the framing, the all of it, while Regina is by his side looking smug as hell. <laughs> this is where Emma realizes that Sidney is in love with Regina Mills in this world and every world, it seems. And Emma tells Regina that as payback for Regina trying to take Mary Margaret away, Emma will take Henry away from Regina for good. She has officially decided that is her son, that is her son and no one else's son. And I think good for her. Mr. Gold is experiencing an entirely new narrative. Regina's trying to complain to him that everything is ruined, uh, but she does realize eventually that he truly doesn't care, that the curse is going to end and everything's going to break and it'll all be different. And she doesn't get why. She doesn't get why he doesn't care. And he doesn't explain it to her and goes to find Emma. He asks Emma what she knows about August, but she doesn't know much. So he starts following August around like a very normal and well-adjusted man. He breaks into August's hotel room, again, like a very normal and well-adjusted, and he finds drawings of the Dark One dagger. And then he finds August having a conversation with the nuns, and Mother Superior tells Gold that August is looking for his estranged father. So Gold has got his red string board out. He's, he's connecting all of the dots and the lines. Gold goes to meet August in the woods, and August calls him Papa, just the way that Bay always did. Gold pours his heart out to August, expressing all of his regrets. August is crying. They hug. August says that he forgives him and that he's looking for that dagger, for the Dark One dagger. It's like a really touching and emotional scene. Gold takes August to the dagger and says August is free to destroy it because he doesn't need that power anymore. Because he's got his Boy. So August grabs the dagger and immediately tries to use it to control gold. The way that the Dark One dagger always worked in the Enchanted Forest, you could use it to kill the Dark One, or you could use it the way that you can use somebody's heart to control their actions. I command thee, Dark One. You're trying to control me? And Gold realizes that this entire thing was a lie because Balefire would have known that there's no magic here. That was the whole point. So Gold, understandably, I think threatens August's life, demands to know who he is, what he wants, why he would do this to him. And August confesses that he's dying, and that he needs magic back to cure him and that he needs to convince Emma. So Gold lets him live, because he would also like Emma convinced. But he's not happy about it. That's just so fucked up, dude. You can't do that to him. Hey, so he's not Balefire. Who the fuck is August, then? Well, Emma's ready to hire Gold to put together a custody case against Regina and get her kid back. But August tells her the only way to beat Regina is to listen to him. 
and Emma does not want to do that. But Henry notices there is a new story in his book of fairy tales, the story of Pinocchio. Yup! In the enchanted forest, Geppetto and Pinocchio are trying to escape a giant whale. You know the story of Pinocchio. And Pinocchio sacrifices his life to save his father, leaving Geppetto cradling a wooden puppet on a beach, sobbing. And it is the best acting performance of the entire show so far. Tony Amendola went, you want me to mourn a puppet? And turned out real, actual distress and grief. He, he is too good for this show. And I think the show knows it. And that's why he never gets anything to do ever again. <laughs> he makes everyone else look bad. Anyway, the Blue Fairy shows up and turns Pinocchio into a real boy. And a real boy he will stay as long as he is brave, truthful, and unselfish. So Geppetto and Pinocchio go to live their happily ever after. But nothing ever lasts, does it? The Blue Fairy shows up at their place where Geppetto and Pinocchio and Jiminy are all having a great day to tell them about the oncoming dark curse. You know, the dark curse that sent them all to Storybrooke. We're finally talking about that again. There is an enchanted tree in the enchanted forest. And if Geppetto can make a wardrobe out of that tree, then Snow White's child will be able to save them all someday. That prophecy. The tree has enough magic, according to the Blue Fairy, to save two people. Yeah, the whole time we were told one person. It's two. The plan initially was to send Snow and Charming through together before Emma gets born so that they could raise the savior in this land without magic. Geppetto asks what will happen to Pinocchio in a land without magic. His son, that was originally a wooden puppet who was made real by magic. And the Blue Fairy can't answer him. She doesn't know. So Geppetto says he's not building the wardrobe unless Pinocchio gets to go through too so that Geppetto knows that he'll be safe. So the plan changes. They will send through Pinocchio and Snow White and the Blue Fairy will lie to everyone else. On the day the dark curse hits, while Snow White is in labor, the Blue Fairy tells Geppetto he must let Snow White and her child go through to have them be the two but he still chooses to save his son. Geppetto tells Pinocchio that it will be his job to watch over the baby. An insane thing to say to a seven-year-old. Please protect this five-minute-old newborn kid. You've got this. And Geppetto sends Pinocchio through. In our world, Pinocchio does take Emma out of the tree and gets them both to a diner across the road where they are picked up and sent to foster care. They're put in a not great foster situation and an older kid at the home tells Pinocchio that he's stolen enough money to get all the kids bus tickets so they can leave, but that they can't take care of a baby. And Pinocchio goes with them. And I can't blame him for that. He was seven in a world that he had been in for a month, maybe. What was he gonna do? He tells the infant that he's sorry, and he says goodbye, and he goes. Honestly, I don't understand how we don't get more explanation on August's childhood. He goes from a seven-year-old runaway to an adult making bad choices with no on-screen time in between. None at all. What did he... He was seven. He just got on a bus, and he was fine? The older kids that he was with, I think the oldest might have been 15... The 15-year-old forged them all papers? Like, I don't... I, I want to know more about that. I want that show. But we don't get that show. We get 35-year-old man August Booth, who is slowly turning back into wood here in Storybrooke, Maine, because he is not unselfish or truthful. In fact, he's been doing a lot of lying. But he is brave. You gotta say that he's brave because he does still go to gold to ask for help. After what you did to him, after what you did to him, I wouldn't look at him. I would walk away. Other direction every time. I see gold, I'm leaving. Goodbye. After what you did to him! August asks Gold for help convincing Emma of the whole fairy tale thing. And Gold does so by telling Emma that he will not help her put a custody case together to get Henry because he doesn't get into fights he can't win. So Emma is left with her only real option, 
being August. Just like how August said. August reveals that he was the seven-year-old boy that found her abandoned on the side of the road as a child. He shows her the tree that they teleported through. He tells her about the blanket that she was found in to prove to her that he knows things that nobody else would have known if they weren't there. And then he tells her that he is Pinocchio and that he's turning into wood. August tries to show Emma his wooden leg, the fact that he is really actually turning back into wood, but she just sees a normal leg. Because she can't see a wooden leg, because she still doesn't believe in magic. Still. Emma wholeheartedly rejects the idea that she's meant to save anyone, and she goes to find Henry, leaving August there, turning into wood. August Booth finally finds and talks to his estranged father. Not Mr. Gold, but Marco. And he asks if he can help Marco repair clocks. I mean, he already knows how. His father taught him. <laughs> I just want Marco to be happy. Is that so, is that so wrong? Is that so wrong? Random sad Italian man in Maine. I just want him to have a good day. I think he's earned one. Regina randomly tries and fails to seduce David. I think because she's mad that Mary Margaret keeps being nice to her and refuses to have her life ruined. It doesn't work. I don't know why she does that. And it's weird. And it's a one off. And then they don't address it ever again. And Emma goes to Henry and asks if he wants to live with her. And he does. He loves her. He's fascinated by her. He wants her around. So she packs him into her car and starts leaving Storybrooke. Let's talk about the last bits of the Enchanted Forest we need to discuss for the season! Okay, so you remember how Snow White drank that forgetting potion to forget about Prince Charming, but then they did a true love's kiss about it, and so now she remembers Prince Charming, but then Prince Charming got dragged away by his father, not his father, King George, because he's in trouble. And Snow White was like, I will find you! I will always find you! That's what the Charmings do. You remember this? Prince Charming was sentenced to execution by King George's guillotine, but the evil queen comes in to save him from that fate, promising George riches and also promising that she's going to make Charming suffer, which is, I guess, what King George wants because he's mad. Snow White, the dwarves, Little Red Riding Hood, and Granny plan an attack to save Prince Charming from King George because they don't know that he's not with King George anymore. <laughs> but in King George's castle, they find an illusion of Charming who explains the situation, which then turns into Regina, who asks Snow to meet her alone in the place where Snow White stole Regina's happiness. That, of course, being where Snow White found Regina and Daniel macking on each other in a stable. It is at this point in her life, that Snow White learns that Daniel died because Regina shows Snow White his grave. This is the only point where she learns that. She went 20 years without knowing that. Regina gives Snow White the ultimatum that Snow White must willingly consume a poisoned apple, the poisoned apple that uh, Hansel and Gretel got her from the blind witch's house. And Snow White must do this or Regina will axe Charming. How many times has Charming's life been threatened this season? Snow White does as Regina asks and succumbs to the sleeping curse, and she is left there on the ground, asleep and unconscious, not even breathing when her friends finally find her. Charming in the evil queen's castle is broken out of his cell by the huntsman, who is still trapped there by Regina as she has his heart, and the evil queen is not pleased about that and teleports Charming into the infinite forest. It's like a forest, but it's infinite. And it is in the infinite forest that Rumpelstiltskin finds him. He's making house calls now and offers to enchant Charming's ring so that it glows brighter and brighter as he gets closer to Snow White. So he has a direction in all of the infinity. He does actually demand a price this time though. He asks for Charming to take the true love potion that he made out of Charming and Snow's hair and to hide it inside of a big monster. Prince Charming does successfully shove this potion inside of Maleficent's dragon form, he gets out alive, back to Rumpelstiltskin, who channels his inner fairy godmother again and gives Charming a fancier outfit to match the occasion. Charming finds Snow White, wakes her up with true love's kiss, and they decide to take back their kingdom 
together. You found me. Did you ever doubt I would? So that's the Enchanted Forest settled. I'm sure we know everything we'll ever have to know about what happened in that place and that we can just focus on our primary timeline forever. Right? Emma has packed Henry Mills into her little car and started driving away. But Henry makes her turn around and go back to Storybrooke because the people there need her. She's the savior. Mary Margaret is very angry that Emma left without saying goodbye because they're very close now. They're roommates and a life on the run would not be good for Emma or for Henry. So Emma decides, you're right. I'll just go without Henry. <laughs> Henry goes to find August, realizes that August is both dying and Pinocchio. But August doesn't seem to want to try anymore. He just wants to spend whatever time he has left with his father. So Henry goes back to Emma, finds her packing, and begs her to stay, please, and break the curse. She tells him he needs to stop believing in fairy tales and promises that she'll come back to visit, but that she just can't hurt him anymore. And fighting with Regina is just hurting him and everybody else. Speaking of Regina, she has been up to some nonsense. She can't work with Gold anymore because Gold wants the curse to break and he won't make any new deals with her because of how he hates her and how they hate each other. So she goes to Jefferson. And I have a way for us to both get what we want. Regina has just enough magic to get Jefferson's hat to work just a little bit and offers to wake up Jefferson's daughter for permission to use the hat. But he doesn't want to put Grace Page through that. Jefferson's price is he wants his own past memories erased and for him and Grace to be together and unaware here. That's a little bit devastating to me. Regina says, fine, that's fine. She'll do that, but not until Emma is gone and dealt with. To make the hat work, Regina has to sacrifice the ring that Daniel used to propose to her, and it only opens just enough to reach a hand through to the enchanted forest, just enough to grab something small. And Regina pulls through her poisoned apple, one bite missing from Snow White and carefully bakes that apple into apple turnovers, which she delivers to Emma as a final show of goodwill for the drive. And then Regina goes to gloat about it to Gold, who's just like, okay, but all magic comes with a price. It's all he knows how to say sometimes. Henry finds that Emma has these apple turnovers and he pleads with her not to eat them because they're poisoned because Regina's the evil queen like of Snow White, you know, apples, come on. But Emma still does not believe him. So Henry picks up a turnover and eats it before collapsing onto the ground. You may not believe in the curse, or in me, but I believe in you. Emma rushes him to the hospital immediately, but there's no signs that he's been poisoned. It's like magic. Emma attacks Regina, and Regina immediately owns up to what she did, and that she's magic, and that magic is really tricky here, because it's not supposed to be here. <laughs> Just so quick, she's like, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, I'm the evil queen and I did a curse and I'm sorry. <laughs> you wake him up! I can't! Don't you have magic? That was the last of it. So they probably need to consult... Rumpelstiltskin! Gold says to fix this, they're going to need his handy dandy true love potion that he had stashed away. And basically just hands Emma her dad's old sword and wishes her good luck. No other explanation. So Emma has to go slay a dragon. That's right. There's been a dragon beneath Storybrooke in those mines with Snow White's coffin the whole time. The whole time time. On her way to go slay a dragon, Emma goes to apologize to a comatose Henry and watches August Booth fully turn into a wooden man. Just to really set the mood. <laughs> Emma does successfully slay a dragon, fully kills Maleficent, and retrieves the potion that Prince Charming stashed inside of that dragon so long ago. On her way back up out of the mines, Gold tricks her into handing over the potion, and Emma finds Regina restrained because Gold played them both. You do not need a potion like that to fix the curse. Idiot, he needed it for something else. So Regina and Emma go to Henry, and they're informed that Henry is gone. He died while they were looking for that potion. Regina and Emma both break down 
in Henry's hospital room, completely distraught. Emma is just crying all over the place and goes to kiss her son on the forehead. And what is this, ladies and gentlemen? Yeah. It's true love's kiss. The sleeping curse breaks. Henry wakes up ecstatic because his mom believes in magic. He's more excited about that than he is about not dying. The dark curse breaks. And the folks in the hospital room inform Regina that she might want to hide. David and Mary Margaret are making out in the middle of the street, referring to each other by their fairy tale names. And Jefferson, shortly before the curse broke, realized that Regina was not going to give him what she promised because the wrong person ate the apple, like that was his fault. So he goes to find Belle, where Regina has her locked up because he remembers things from the Enchanted Forest. I actually don't know how he knows about Belle. They did not know each other. It doesn't matter. And he sends a deeply confused, traumatized Belle to find gold and inform him that Regina is the one who had her hidden away. It's literally the perfect play. That is so good. You are a madman for that. <laughs> like, Belle doesn't know what she's getting into here. Belle doesn't know anything. It's, oh, it's so good. <laughs> He could have done that at any point, at any point in the last 28 years. And I really think it would have broken gold out of the curse. I think it would have done it. So Rumpelstiltskin, reunited with his true love, takes Belle out into the middle of the woods to a wishing well, where he drops the true love potion down to bring something back. And magic starts pouring into Storybrooke as a thick cloud of smoke and that's the end of season one. God damn, what a show. Honestly, I loved season one so much. And so did a lot of people. Almost 13 million people watched the premiere on cable and almost 10 million watched the finale. It was a big deal. It was a big show. People loved it. It's not hard to see why so many people got hooked and felt like they needed to keep watching it later on when it starts to get how it gets. But that's getting ahead of myself. Gaties and gentlemen, it is time for the season one roundup. We're doing a little roundup at the end of every single season. I have some things to rank. I have some things to say. I have to see if I can turn this thing upside down. Oh, light work. Don't worry, don't worry, easy. I remain obsessed with the costuming and outfits on this show, so let's talk about the two best outfits of the season. The number one best outfit of the season to me is iconic, is beautiful. Set the tone immediately for the show and also immediately let me know I was going to be obsessed with every look they put her in. That's right. It's the evil queen wedding crasher. It's a pantsuit. It's a long train. It's bejeweled. It's that weird pointed headpiece they have her in. She looks evil. She looks gorgeous. It's so good. It's so good. All I have to say about it is it's so good. I think what you put your evil queen in can really make or break and define her vibes. And they did it perfectly with Regina from the get-go. Hell yes. So if first place goes to Regina, goes to that over-the-top, shiny, tight, sparkling, extravagant wedding crasher outfit, who gets second place? It's probably not who you're expecting. For me, second place goes to Jefferson not even trying. Dressed like that in the middle of Maine. Not suspicious at all. He's walking around in a vest and a cravat. And he's staring longingly at a fourth grader from a window. Lonely, enigmatic forest billionaire. He's perfect. Yes, Jefferson had all of his enchanted forest memories, but he knew damn well how people dressed here in Maine. And he didn't even bother. And he looked great. And I think it says a lot about his character that he continued to dress like that and not even try. I think it really speaks to sort of the, the apathy he felt in general. And also, it's Sebastian Stan. That did a lot of the heavy lifting. Characters. Top three characters of the season. Not characters who did the best. Not characters who won. Just the characters that I walked out of the season going, yes. Yes. 
you. Uh, also, I should say, all of these notes, all of my roundups are based exclusively on season one data. If you look at my data and you disagree based on things that happen not in season one, you're in the wrong place. This is for season one. Okay, for my data. We'll start in third place. In third, I have a character who got the fuck out of Dodge, was not interested in the goings-on, and simply left them behind to remain unproblematic. That's right. It's gotta go to Balefire. That 14-year-old knew exactly what he wanted, and it was the exact opposite of what he was experiencing. He was not interested in evil magics or whatever was going on with his dad. <laughs> and he got out of there. I'm very sorry that a grown-up Pinocchio tried to impersonate you. He didn't do a very good job, and that's okay. Also, he was just such a cute kid. You can't deny it. He was doing a good job out there. I love children, and in fact, all characters that decide what their morals are and stick to them literally no matter what. It's powerful. It's very paladin. Speaking of, in second place, it must be Geppetto. Geppetto did such a super fucked up thing. <laughs> by not allowing Snow White to go through the portal to the world without magic with her daughter so that she could raise her daughter. Super a fucked up thing. But he did it because he was that dedicated to saving his son before he was dedicated to saving the world. And that is what love is. I respect the hell out of him for that. Was it good for Emma? No, it was not. Was it good for the general state of the world? No, it was not. Was it good for Pinocchio? I don't know. <laughs> it's very possible that without him doing that, Pinocchio would have just been a wooden marionette in Gold's shop instead of a man allowed to explore the world and make his own bad but his own choices out of free will. So I don't know if we can say if it was good for, for Pinocchio. But God, do I respect it. Top character of this season, sticking with the theme of characters who stick to their guns so hard all the time, we have Henry Mills. Iconic. He lived in a horror movie his entire life and decided it simply was not for him. <laughs> And he would do whatever it took to change it. How many times must you look at your birth mother and insist to her that magic and fairy tales are real, only to have her look at you with increasing pity every single time before you eventually decide that maybe magic isn't? It has to be at least one more time than that happened to Henry. I think Henry Mills is I conic in this season. I truly do. I truly do. I know that a lot of people get annoyed by children and by child actors. I think he did a good job. I think he was adorable. And I think he rules. And that leads us to decide who is the biggest loser of the season. Who walked out covered in L's? There's really only one answer. <laughs> Regina Mills lost at every single turn, no matter who her opponent was, and then poisoned her kid with a curse that has a 0% long-term success rate. I'm sorry to do this to you, queen, but there was just no other option. And with that, we are done with season one of Once Upon a Time. Are you ready for season two? I hope so, here we go! Psych, I asked, and people want me to split this show into one video per season, so that's what we're doing. Expect these videos to drop semi-frequently and to get less and less coherent as the show devolves into a parody of its already very silly concept, and we are going to have so much fun together. Uh, and by frequently, I mean like two a month. That's the hope. It's a lot to do, though. Okay, I'm pretty much a one-man band over here, and these bitches are long because I don't know how to be quiet. <laughs> if you wish that you'd gotten this video early, extra power in how it turned out, lots more glimpses of the cat, and extra secret special videos every single month, I cannot recommend my Patreon enough. Okay, it's over at patreon.com slash Haley Whipjack, and everyone there is such a complete and utter delight. Folks such as Annie G, Autumn Vector, Jelly Bun, Ollie D, Raffi, Zebby Lown, A Bitter Taste of, Aiden Cassis, Aiden So Wood, Amy Ernst, AJ Hollian, Alex, Alex is not amazing, Anna Elise, Anna K, Amalia, Alex Pluto Murphy, 
Ashley Figura, uh, Azula's Tally, Botakid, Barbarians are the best class, Beard Acknowledge, Becca B, Bex Rhodes, B, Box of Cherubs, Brain Boy, Kuste, Kodia, Ostalasa, Danny, Daniel, Declan Roof, Devin Ellert, Eli Gibson, Emma B, Foolery with Nori, Fuckaroo, Finch R, Gabby, GN0W1, Graham Harrison, Infinity Girl, Jacqueline Mancini, James David, James Somers, Jasmine Taylor, Jane, Jenny Waboom, Jessica Paid, John Haynes, Jordi LaForge, JT Frazier, Karen Elizabeth Welch, Carissa, KCZ, Kendra Rosser, Lawson, Liam John Lawson, Lula, Martine, Mary R., Matt Ross, Max Faring, Michaela Phillips, Mo Spooky, Murph Was Ear, Nick Stevens, Noah, Octave, Oski the Bar, Rebecca Don, Rowan C., Sky Travis, Styx, Tex the Gentle Giant, The Plum Sater, The Ace Pelican, Unholy Fish, Will, Woody Daniel, Ngve Leo, and Zachary McMinn. Whether your name was on that list, whether you're on my Patreon at all, or whether you're just here to have a good time and have something to listen to while you fold your laundry, it's waiting for you. I really appreciate you taking the time to hang out with me, and I really hope I will see you so soon with the next installment of What the Hell is Happening on Once Upon a Time. (laughs) See you there. I really hope y'all stick with these videos. If you aren't already familiar with the decline you're about to witness, it is truly something to behold.